And before I invite you all to rise and say the Pledge of Allegiance, I want to recognize and welcome our newest board member, Roger Hayden. <coughs> Roger brings to us uh, a great wealth of knowledge and experience as both the former county executive of our great county and as a former board chair of this uh, school board. So, Roger, we all welcome you. Now I ask you all to uh, join me and rise uh, and recite the Pledge of Allegiance to be led by Nylea and Nalani Johnson. We will then remain standing for a moment of silence in memory of and in thanks for our fallen soldier hero Eric Houck, a 2007 graduate of Perry Hall High School. His deeds will never be forgotten. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Our next agenda item is to consider the agenda. Are there any additions or changes to tonight's agenda? There are none. Uh, hearing none, is there a motion to adopt the agenda? So moved. Is there a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries. The agenda is as prepared and delivered. Uh, next on our agenda is selection of speakers. Uh, Sign-up cards were available to the public prior to the meeting for anyone wishing to speak at this evening's meeting. Board practice limits to 10 the number of speakers at a regularly scheduled board meeting. Each speaker is allowed three minutes to address the board. The completed sign-up cards for this evening have been placed in the box to my right, and the first 10 drawn from the box will be our speakers for tonight. Ms. Bratt is doing her last duty as the name picker. <laughs> <laughs> Sharon Saroff. Nina Sir, <coughs> Bosch Farone, Diana Williams, Five. Neil Williams, Diana Bergman, Marion Moore, David Green. Um, the next item on our agenda is uh, item E, unfish, unfinished business, the interim superintendent's contract, and I call on Mr. Yulefelder. Thank you, Mr. Gillis. <clears throat> I have a resolution uh, for the board. Whereas the superintendent of schools for Baltimore County, Dr. S. Dallas Stans, has resigned effective June 30, 2017, after five successful years as superintendent and the Board of Education has decided to appoint an interim superintendent for the period July 1, 2017 through June 30, 2018. And whereas the Board of Education has determined that Ms. Verita White is the individual who will best serve the county public schools as its interim superintendent, and whereas Verita White has capably and effectively served the school system since 1995 in a number of capacities and is currently the chief academic officer, a position that she has held since 2013. And whereas at its meeting of May 23rd, 2017, <clears throat> board unanimously agreed that Ms. White should serve as interim superintendent. And whereas the board and Ms. White have tentatively mutually agreed to the terms of an employment contract, therefore be it resolved, the Board of Education hereby appoints Verita White as the interim superintendent of schools for a one-year term of office effective July 1, 2017, under the terms of the tentative agreed upon employment contract, subject to the statutory mandate mandated approval of the state superintendent of schools. Is there a second on that resolution? Second. second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Congratulations.
on behalf of the board, we all look forward to working with you. And uh, come July 1, I know you'll be ready to be up and running. Thank you very much. Mm. Our next item is a special order of business, item F, and it's a recognition of our student board member. And I invite Ms. Bratt to come forward along with Ms. Johnson. Importantly, Ms. Prumo also has flowers. So we have a resolution. Whereas, whereas Aislinn Bratt has served as a student member of the Board of Education of Baltimore County with honor and distinction for the 2016-17 school year, including participation on the board's curriculum committee, and whereas she has served as a member of the Superintendent's Student Advisory Council, and whereas Aislinn's outstanding academic performance has been affirmed in many ways by competing nationally with Capital Debate, named a National Merit Scholarship Commended Student, and in the top 5% of her graduating class, and whereas she has graduated Baltimore County Public Schools well prepared to begin her next phase of her education at Villanova University, now therefore be it resolved that the Board of Education of Baltimore County assembled in regular session this 13th day of June 2017 expresses to Aislinn Bratt its fondest regards and gratitude for her service and to be it further resolved that the board does herewith extend its best wishes for happiness, good health, and continued success in future endeavors and that it directs a copy of this resolution be recorded among the permanent records of the Board of Education of Baltimore County. I move that we second this. All in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed. It's resolution time. Next, we have a resolution recognizing Romaine Williams, and we invite her to come join us. <laughs> Whereas Romaine N. Williams Esquire has served as a member of the Board of Education of Baltimore County with distinction and honor from February 2013 through April 2017, and whereas she has provided exemplary service to the students, parents, and staff of Baltimore County Public Schools, and whereas Ms. Williams has worked actively for the achievement of all Baltimore County students with focus on equity for all students, and whereas she has served on the following Board of Education committees, Building and Contracts Committee, and the Policy Review Committee, where she served as chair, and whereas Ms. Williams represented the board on the National School Boards Association's Council of Urban Boards of Education, and whereas she also she always placed the needs of all students as her first priority, and whereas Ms. Williams has committed her time and expertise to the Baltimore County Public Schools community. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Board of Education of Baltimore County herewith assembled in regular session on the 13th day of June 2017 recognizes the outstanding contributions of Romaine N. Williams Esquire, and be it further resolved that the Board does herewith extend its deepest appreciation and gratitude for her dedication, loyalty, and service, and further extends its best wishes for good health, happiness, and continued success in her future endeavors. Congratulations. Seconded. All in favor say aye. 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 We have a special guest, <laughs> Mr. Williams. Well, he put up with me being away from home all the time. So I thought it fitting for him to be in this picture. Uh 
Thank you. Thank you all so very much. I love you all, and I wish everyone well. <laughs> and on behalf of the Education Foundation of Baltimore County Public Schools, for your dedication and support to Baltimore County Public Schools, we want to give you a small token of our appreciation for your service. Every page tells a story. Oh, wow. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, you've been a star, a real star in education and support. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to save time. Right. <laughs> Next. Mm. Is there a little, a little cheat sheet? No, uh, it was in your script. Okay, here, grab that off my desk. Under here? Yep, first one. You can't know his name without having it written down. <laughs> okay, Mr. Yulefelder. Which one is it? We, well, we can't tell you yet. Okay. <laughs> Mr. Yulefelder served as the 2014 president and then chair of the Board of Education. Tradition has it that following one's retirement yeah, from the office of president or chair, a formal portrait is done and then placed among the other former president's portraits in room 123 across the hall. So at this time, on behalf of the board, I would ask everyone to join me in acknowledging the leadership and dedication of Mr. Yulefelder. Uh, who has provided the board and the school system uh, with great leadership during his tenure. We appreciate your continued work as a member of the board. Thank you. Thank you. You know, as Ed said, um, this was always a tradition after someone has left the board. So now I think about myself and I gotta sit and eat dinner and look at myself and <laughs> that, that really is unusual. But I just realized that I'm not alone. Mr. Hayden also has his picture in here a few years earlier than this one, <laughs> but we both can look at it. Thank you so much. It's really been a pleasure. Uh, uh, I've served on many boards and chaired many boards, but I got to tell you, the uh, the last nine years have, have really been a learning experience, and I would hope that every citizen in Baltimore County would have the opportunity to really learn and understand our school system. It, it is a huge, huge undertaking. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Yulefutter. Sit tight, because surprise, surprise, Ms. Phelps might have a gift for you. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah, slide over here the other side. Mr. Yulefelder, yes, on behalf of the Education Foundation of Baltimore County Public Schools, we thank you for serving as an ex officio on our board of directors, and we still want you there with us. I'd love to. But for all the service that you've given to our schools and everyone in Baltimore County, this is for you. Thank Every you. page tells a story. <laughs> thank you. You're finished, I think. Are we? That's it for now. friend Dr. Dance is not here. We have a resolution for Dr. Dance as well. Whereas Dr. S. Dallas Dance has served as superintendent of the Baltimore County Public Schools with honor and distinction since 2012, 
whereas through his development of Blueprint 2.0 and the theory of action, he established a culture of deliberate excellence focused on equity for every student. And whereas, as a result of Dr. Dance's leadership, Baltimore County's uh, schools have achieved what all systems aspire, steadily rising rates of student achievement as evidenced by the 89.2 graduation rate, which has increased for the past six years, closing the graduation rate gap between black and white students, and the steady growth for students in grades one to eight in reading and math. And whereas due to his focus on student achievement, Baltimore County Public Schools was awarded the Trusted Learning Environment Seal by the Consortium for Net School Networking, demonstrating a strong commitment to student data privacy and security, named a District of Distinction by District Administration in honor of students and teachers accessing tomorrow, STAT, and making graduation a priority named a Digital Citizenship Certified District by Common Sense for demonstrating a whole community approach to preparing students to use digital media safely, won 11 awards from the Chesapeake Chapter of the National School Public Relations Association Awards of Excellence, and for the first time this year named National School Library Program of the Year. And whereas supporting all students is Dr. Dance's first priority, he enhanced special education services and magnet programs, expanded preschool access, increased support and resources to English learners and students' support services, and provided opportunities for early college access. And whereas through his team BCBS campaign, he has brought together communities in support of the system, and whereas Dr. Dance's focus on equity and changing the climate of schools has resulted in the establishment of mentoring programs, student advisory panels and princip for principals, restorative practices, and new after-school activities to engage students, and whereas his boundless energy and passion in pursuit of educational excellence has served the students and families of Baltimore County Public Schools. Now, therefore, be it resolved by, that the Board of Education herewith assembled in regular session this 13th day of June 2017 <laughs> expresses to Dr. Dallas Dance, on behalf of the citizens of the county, our deepest appreciation and gratitude for his valuable service, and be it further resolved that a copy of this resolution be recorded among the permanent records of the Baltimore County Board of Education. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? It's still a mystery. It's still a mystery. Mm -hmm. I'll be very honest with you. And I would like to do something to solve the mystery solved or whatever it is. No. No. Uh, it just, it, that rubs me, to be honest with you. It really rubs me. I don't think it's a position anyplace else. I think we would have. I remain. Hi, sweetheart. Bye, Romaine. <laughs> well, what's up, Denver? Do good for our kids in Baltimore County. <laughs> <laughs> all right, the next item on our agenda after all that wonderful business is the superintendent's report, and I ask Ms. Brumo to speak. Thank you, Mr. Gillis. On behalf of Dr. Dallas Stance, he would like for me to share the following with you. As we all know, today is the last day of school for school year 2016-17. Team BCPS has much to be proud of, including a stronger focus on culture and climate, more responses to the stakeholder survey, greater STEM exposure through the Mobile Innovation Lab, higher graduation rates, more gains on the measures of academic progress, and so much more. All Team BCPS work together, the residents, leaders, businesses, and school communities to support all students. And Dr. Dance, Mr. Hayden, would like to also, on behalf of Team BCPS, welcome you to the Board of Education as you return. As uh, Mr. Gillis said, you served as county executive from 1990 to 94 and served on this board from 1978 to 87, including six years as president. So we welcome you back. As we welcome Mr. Hayden, um, 
As of June the 15th, Ms. Marisol Johnson will be resigning as a member of the Board of Education. Tonight is her last board meeting, and all of us, all of Team BCPS, wishes to thank Ms. Johnson for her four years of service to our students and schools. She has led both the Curriculum Committee and most recently the Policy Review Committee, always standing up for equity and opportunity. Ms. Johnson, you will be missed. Thank you. Last Thursday, our last group of seniors walked across the stage to cap off 27 graduation ceremonies. In case you missed it, 13 of our high schools have been named among the best in the nation by U.S. News and World Report and the Washington Post. Dr. Dance is proud to have been part of these timeless graduation moments with many members of the board and many staff and leaders. Our summer graduates will th have their chance to shine at a ceremony on August 19th. Abigail Fanshaw, who is a student at Delaney High School, was recognized in the June 2017 issue of the American School Board Journal for her poem, How We Learn. Abigail was one of the 15 students selected to perform an original poem to accompany the middle and high school all honors county um, dance ensemble during the 2017 State of the Schools event for those of you who are able to see that. Thomas Gensel, executive director and CEO of the National School Boards Association, attended the event and asked Abigail's permission to reprint her poem because it captured in his words why public education in America really matters. And lastly, we'd like to congratulate Ms. Verlita White, interim superintendent. With her vast experience, her wealth of knowledge, and the strong relationships she has developed throughout the system, Ms. White will serve the students, staff, and parents and community of this system well. D Team BCPS is in full support. Thank you, Verlita. And Mr. Gillis, that concludes the superintendent's report. Thank you, Ms. Primo. Uh, this is the opportunity next on our agenda for the uh, chair to make comments. Uh, today was the last day of school and signals the beginning of a busy summer of planning and preparation for the 2017-2018 school year. On behalf of the board, I thank all of our teachers, administration, and staff for making 2016-2017 such a success. And I offer encouragement for continued focus leading into 2017-2018 to make BCPS as great as it can be, affording opportunity for all of our 112,000 students. Today, as we know, is also the last board meeting for our superintendent, uh, who will be departing in just a few weeks. Uh, Dr. Dance's five years with the Baltimore County Public Schools have been important in the history of our system. His energy, his vision, and his commitment to academic success, graduating globally competitive young men and women, will serve as our future's foundation. On behalf of the board, I offer my thanks to Dr. Dance and wish him all good things in the years to come. Uh, we have also just recognized our former board member, Romaine Williams. Romaine shared her talents with the board for four years, and uh, I know all of us uh, thank her for that. We've also just recognized our student member, Aislin Bratt, who will soon begin the next chapter in her academic life at Villanova University. The board thanks Aislin for her commitment to BCPS and wishes her all good things in the years to come. And please come back for vi visits. Uh, and that will be my remarks and a great segue into the next item on the agenda, Ms. Bratt's comments. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I'd like to congratulate all students, teachers, administrators, and other BCPS staff on completing another successful year here at BCPS. Since this is my last board meeting, I'd like to start off by saying what an honor and privilege it has been to serve as a member of this board. <coughs> It's been an amazing experience that has allowed me to meet so many inspirational people and has enriched my understanding and appreciation of all the work that goes into making a system as large as BCPS run smoothly. The people around this table work incredibly hard and demonstrate impressive dedication to improving the school system. I'd also like to extend thanks to a few people. 
Ms. Murray, the BCSE advisor, and Deesha Walia, the previous student member of the board, for their guidance and support as I transitioned into this position and throughout this year. And finally, I'd like to thank Jordan Wilson. This year, Jordan served as the president of the Baltimore County Student Council, but that's just the tip of the iceberg um, of her service to Baltimore County. She's been with the Baltimore County Student Council since middle school, and I can't say how impressive her work has been and how grateful I am to have met her and become a friend. Without these people, I would not have been able to be in this position. Um, since the last time I updated everyone, um, the Baltimore County Student Council has assumed a new student leadership. Um, and I'd like to recognize them really quickly. Jake Turner from Hereford High School was elected as our 2017-2018 president. Angela Chin from Delaney High School has been elected as our 2017-2018 vice president. Sammy Warfel from Hereford Middle was elected as our second vice president. And Noreen Badwee from Towson High School was elected as our public relations director. This officer team has already been busy at work this summer and has selected the next executive board. For students who are still looking for another way to get involved in county government, in the student county, county government, next year there will be a lot of opportunities for students to stay involved. I'm sure the next president will be giving his report soon, but our fall camp registration is still open and we will have four general assemblies next year open to all students, which will be great ways for people to get involved. To conclude, I believe the school system is moving in a positive direction and will continue to move in that direction as we are joined by new members and are now under the capable leadership of Verlita White. I'm excited to see what the future holds for BCPS and its 113,000 students. Thank you. And that concludes my remarks. Thank you, Aislinn. Next on our agenda is item M, public comment. Our, um, this is an opportunity the board provides to hear the views and receive the advice of community members. Uh, the members of the board appreciate hearing from interested citizens. As appropriate, we refer concerns to the superintendent for follow-up. While we encourage public input on policy programs and practices within the purview of the board, uh, this is not the proper form to address specific student or employee matters or to comment on matters that do not relate to public education in Baltimore County. We encourage everyone to utilize existing resolution processes as appropriate. I ask that you observe the three minute clock, uh, which will let you know when your time is up. Please conclude your remarks when you hear the bell or see that your time has expired. I now call on our advisory group um, stakeholder and stakeholders to speak. The first is the Baltimore County Student Council representative, Jake Turner. Um, good evening, board. Um, good evening. My name is Jake Turner, and I'm the current Baltimore County Student, Student Council president. Uh, and my name is Noreen Badwe, and I'm the current public relations director. Um, so we just wanted to just, uh, let you guys know that we would really love uh, to work with the new superintendent, Ms. White, and all board members next year to continue to grow the student voice in BCPS and advocate for our needs to the Board of Education. Um, and we thank you very much for the opportunity to speak to you tonight, and we look forward to doing it more in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Jake. Thank you. Congratulations and welcome. Our next speaker from TABCO is Abby Baton. Ms. Baton. Good evening. Good evening. Chairman Jill Gillis, <laughs> Vice Chairwoman Johnson, <laughs> members of the board. Uh, first of all, there are lots of people to say welcome and farewell, and um, it's bittersweet. So Roger, welcome. I haven't seen you in quite a while, but we are glad to have you here, and we look forward to working with you. And to Aislinn, every year we have to say goodbye to the student members, and I have to tell you, every year I am more and more impressed, so thank you for all the work you've done. Marisol Johnson, uh, thank you for all the work you have done as well. Uh, it's tough. We've lost several board members this year, and um, luckily um, you're going to move on, hopefully, to bigger and better things. So we wish you luck. Thank you. 
And even though he's not here tonight, I did want to take this opportunity to thank Dr. Dance for his hard work as our superintendent. <coughs> he has indeed brought change and vision to Baltimore County. We have the PAR program in place because he understood the need for collaborative work to enhance our evaluation system. He brought technology upgrades that were sorely needed, and now we are about to embark on bringing community schools to provide the opportunity for communities to reinvest their time and commitment to their local schools. There have been bumps in the road, and not every initiative has been, has been implemented as we would have liked, but I have always known that Dr. Dance cared about the students and wanted the very best for all staff. We wish him well in whatever he chooses as his next endeavor. I am sure he will, we will be hearing great things about him in the future. Next, I would like to report that the TAPCO members voted on the negotiated agreement and overwhelmingly voted to ratify the master agreement. The votes were counted yesterday. The contract has some important language to continue to move us forward as we all work collaboratively. We are hopeful the board will do likewise tonight as we move forward to, ne to the next school year. As I have stated before, TABCO has a hardworking committee specifically addressing the discipline issues surrounding our schools. The committee has been working not only to identify the issues that face our schools, but providing solutions that we are confident will help struggling schools address the issues head on. We really would wish that you and urge you again to delay any changes to the discipline policy until we can complete and share our work with BCPS officials. And finally, our student, uh, our special education committee continues to act work with BCPS officials on special education issues and have had several productive meetings as we move forward on this topic. We applaud BCPS for the collaborative nature in which we could address the issues and come up with solutions for positive changes. While we have a long way to go, we are definitely on the right path. And I wish everyone a wonderful summer, even those of us who work all year long, the summer has a different pace and feel to it. Take time for your friends and family and just enjoy. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Baden. Thank you. Our next speaker is from the Special Education Citizens Advisory Committee, and that's Elizabeth Hembling. Ms. Hembling. Members of the board, Ms. White. Um, I'm here again on behalf of CCAC because this Orton Gillingham contract is so important for the students who struggle with reading and can't learn to read using the balanced literacy approaches um, that Baltimore County currently uses. For those of you, and there are so many on the board now that are new, um, may not know my story. I have two children, one who remains in Baltimore County and one that doesn't. My daughter Mia went all the way through sixth grade in Baltimore County, three grade levels behind in reading, and nobody noticed. No one identified her as a struggling reader, much less a student with dyslexia. She was a student who sat in general education classes who couldn't read a sentence without error. She slipped through the cracks. I finally pulled her out of Baltimore County so she could help get the help she needed. And after two years of appropriate instruction, with an Orton Gillingham structured literacy approach, she has graduated eighth grade with her reading on grade level. Mm. Mia it was interviewed recently by the National Public Radio about her experience. And when she was asked where she would have been had she not gotten this help, she replied, shockingly to me actually, <laughs> that she would have dropped out of school. Mm. This is an equity issue. How many Mias are sitting in Baltimore County? How many kids are sitting in general education classes with unidentified reading failure? How many struggling readers, quote unquote, are actually dyslexic like Mia? And how many of those kids ultimately become behavior problems or drop out altogether because they can't get the help that I paid for? According to the 2016 Park scores, 63% of Baltimore County third graders are below expectations in English and 40% are partially met expectations or lower. 
What is the solution? If you don't know anything about Wharton Gillingham, I've given you a reference sheet from the International Dyslexia Association. It's a method that explicitly teaches some um, systematic word identification and decoding strategies. Some of the elements covered are morphology, sounds of language, sound symbol relationships, vowel sounds and syllables, syntax and semantics. It's cumulative and systematic, is individualized to the student and diagnostic in nature. A dyslexic student requires explicit instruction to learn to read, but additionally, this method will help other students who struggle to read, even English language learners. About 95% of all kids can learn to read with these same methods that work for dyslexic students. This isn't a boxed program. It's not a computer program. It's a method of teaching. Tonight, you're voting on the contract, contract MBU 51317, to get BCPS teachers trained in Norton Gillingham. Please vote yes on this contract. Thank you. Our next advisory and stakeholder speaker is the Area Education Advisory Council representative from the Northeast, that's Thor Trigveson. Good evening, board members. I'd like to call your attention to the uh, risk that the um, Transportation Department of uh, BCPS exposes our kids to. They're gambling with the safety of children that attend BCPS schools every day. According to the National Highway Transportation Safety Administration, federal regulation do not specify the number of people who can sit on a school bus seat. The school, the school bus manufacturers determine the maximum safe seating capacity on a bus. I reached out to bus manufacturers regarding seating to find out what the recommendations are. No one suggested more than two middle school students to a bus seat for safety reasons, not a single manufacturer. Buses are simply not built to take more than two middle school students to a seat. BCBS Transportation finds it quite okay that almost half of the buses at the severely overcrowded Perry Hall Middle School pack in more students than what's considered to be safe by the manufacturers of the buses. Some of them carry 43% more passengers than what is considered safe. Even putting students on the floor of the buses with possible catas cat uh, catastrophe, uh, those passengers are our daughters and our sons. It is absolutely unacceptable that BCPS transportation circumvents the manufacturer's security guidelines to save pennies on transportation. <coughs> You cannot gamble with our children's lives like that. How long are you willing to play roulette with our children's lives? Are you ready and willing to shoulder the responsibility and suffer the consequences of an accident? Please act now and solve the transportation issue in the Northeastern area. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Tigerson. It's now time for public comment, and our first speaker is Sharon Saroff. Good evening, members of the board. Good evening. Good evening. I think some of you know me as a special ed advocate in Baltimore County and other counties, and I'm here tonight to give you some solutions to some problems that I've seen an uptick in in the past three years since we have eliminated the what was used to be called the adaptive learning support classes on the elementary level. Um, we have a trend in this county of moving towards less support, less is more. I'm here to tell you that less isn't more. I'm the parent of two children who graduated, thankfully, from your county, one just a week and a half ago, both having IEPs, both having their needs not met unless I fought for them. And I fight every day for the students that are my clients. The solutions that I, that I feel we need to look at and not look at the dollars look at the long-term picture. We need to bring back those classes that we took away 
Those students cannot learn in a class of 25 to 30 students without the necessary supports. We need to have smaller class size all the way around. Again, no one learns very well in a class of 35 kids. We need to have more professional development for our teachers and particularly for our administrators. I have met numerous administrators over the course of the last year that don't even know that there are timelines in the federal law IDEA that don't even know of the five-day rule that those of us, like myself, fought so hard to get, which is to provide paperwork to parents five days before a meeting. We need to make sure that we provide equity and accountability, and I'm going to underline the word accountability for all the students in this county, the special ed students, the GT students, the twice exceptional students, no matter where they are in the county. The Supreme Court spoke with a decision. It's no longer acceptable to give the minimum to these kids we need to give the maximum to these kids. We need to stop doing what we're doing in this county. I have a job because we're not doing what we need to do. Hey. Thank you, Ms. Sarah. Our next speaker is Nina Sir. Um, hello, members of the board, chairman, Hi. vice chairman. Uh, I'm a parent of a child at Patapsco High School. I would be remiss if I didn't say thank you for the renovation co coming up and the fact that the renovation isn't going to address the worst need, which is for space, because we are overcrowded and our trailers are older than most of the students. So um, I, with that out of the way, what I really wanted to talk to today was BCPS1, the web system that lets us check in on our kids' grades. Uh, there's this thing that's been bothering me since the new grading system came in. I know it's really small, it's really petty, but I've tried complaining through the normal, met the, the normal ch looking channels and didn't get any response. When you first open up BCPS1 and you go to the page that has all your kids' grades on it, um, when it was A, B, C, D grades, you'd have A plus, A minus, B plus, B minus. Now that it's 2.5, 2.7, whatever, the number after the decimal point is cut off. So I can't tell from that first page whether my kids got a 2.9 or a 2.0, which there is a huge difference in the new grading system. So I really would appreciate it if somebody in the IT would take a look at expanding that landing page so that we could see whether my kids got an A or a C. So thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Sir. Our next speaker is Bosch Ferrone. Yeah. Yeah. Good evening to all. Good evening. Uh, Mr. Hayden, welcome. And um, I remember you as a county executive. Um, <laughs> Farewell to Mr. Olfelder. I will miss um, I will miss Dr. Dance really. Um, Romaine too. Thank you all for your work. I really like to remind you to speak into the microphone. You know, be close all the time, including the law office back there. But also, I ask you to speak up. I ask you to speak up against overcrowding overcrowding in this school system reminds me of the schools I went to when I was very young. This is the United States. I ask you to speak up against unsafe transportation, unsafe buildings, buildings without air conditioners in this hot weather, almost 100 degrees. Um, I ask you to speak up against inadequate staffing and teachers and I ask you really to work on the issue of drugs in, this, in the school system and around it. It's really important. Against bullying, 
against teaching students the wrong things so when they grow up they do the wrong things when they are leaders or business executives. Also, as a physician, I need you to think about what we feed them in the cafeteria. Two enemies for all of us Americans are the sodium level and the calories, sugar and sodium, two enemies. <clears throat> and in school system, they get used to it. When they grow up, they become diabetics and they become hypertension, kidney failure, and so forth. Um, I ask you to consider professional days to be virtual days. This is the United States of America. Teachers don't have to be there physically and the schools closed on professional days. It can be done virtually and that would really free some two or three days in the school system. I also ask you to consider be clearer about the metrics by which the school system evaluate every problem. I really don't know all the metrics. I hear some of the ones in the school system that during discussions, but I think it needs to be more open, somehow more visible on the website. And the metrics could be about the grades or about teacher evaluation or any other projects. And last but not least, I ask you for diversity. Teachers should not be Jews and Christians. You got to remember Muslims, you got to remember Hindus, Sikhs, and I think that diversity is lacking in our school system. It's very clear. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Fern. Our next speaker is Diana Williams. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Um, I am a parent of two Delaney graduates, and I also have two children uh, to come at Delaney. Um, and so I'm here to speak to you about the conditions at Delaney High School. Um, first of all, there's an overcrowding issue, which will only grow. Um, the deplorable conditions that students are expected to learn in are just appalling. Um, we, you all know what they are. I'm not going to go through the list. Um, there's pipes bursting, which shouldn't be a concern of the staff or the students as they go about their regular days. And the teachers are trying their best to educate our children to be successful as they go on to continued education or onto careers when they graduate from Delaney. The teachers are doing an outstanding job. Um, and yet they're teaching in a building that is not fit for the 21st century. It's very unfair, not just to the students, but to the teachers and the staff who are trying their best to educate our students. So I hope you consider them and Delaney High School as you think about uh, the 2019 budget. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Neil Williams. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, so thank you, board, and uh, thank you, Ms. White, for uh, allowing us to voice our concern about Delaney. Uh, you just met my lovely wife, uh, my better half. And uh, I'll take a little bit of a different tack. Uh, I would implore the board to maybe look at a more comprehensive approach um, Board member Ulfilter just recently mentioned that it is a very difficult job that you all have. And there's many voices that are looking for the slice of the pie uh, that Mr. Kramenitz can, can offer. Um, but what I would say is as you look at other counties within Maryland, some have taken um, a viewpoint to look at every school in every element, whether it be middle, elementary or high, and look at them to say, okay, which particular schools need to be raised 
and rebuilt and which schools are going to be like Delaney subject to a potential overcrowding in the next two or three years. So, you know, you have a very difficult job, I understand that, but as a parent of a child in elementary school, a child who's just graduating from Ridgely that's going to Delaney for the next four years, we certainly know that, um, you know, the FY19 budget is something that we would like you to consider Delaney and a more comprehensive approach for the school system um, as it stands today. So thank you, appreciate your time. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. Williams. Our next speaker is Diana Bergman. Good evening, everybody. Good How's evening. everybody doing? There's a lot of new faces. My name is Diana Bergman, and I want to bring up something that I discovered this past month and a half. Um, it's a sensitive topic regarding bullying and the concerns a lot of parents and teachers have personally reached out to me to talk about. Um, I don't know why they're reaching out to me. I've had some parents actually show up at my house, which is a little odd. but. <laughs> I think they think that I could help. I have a voice that's very neutral that could help with the situation. And one of the things I noticed that's very common, a lot of the families were calling me from the Southwest area and the Southeast area. And one of the things I noticed that everybody had the same similar concerns, the safety of the children and how they're not resolving conflict among themselves. They need guidance in that. And the missing piece of what I noticed comes down to communication. Meaningful two-way communication needs to happen in order to address this bullying issue going on with these children. Not just from the parents, from the administrators, from the teachers, from the kids, to show and guide them how to resolve conflict so it doesn't escalate. We're seeing secondary school where the children are not keeping their hands to themselves, something that we remind them at a very young age of elementary school and preschool. And for whatever reason, it's like they don't have the certain supports in place. And we need to figure out how to work together to support these children to learn those social skills and those developments. If you look at the elementary level, the kids are not socializing as well either. It's like they're lacking some of these basic skills that are taught very early from three to four years old. And it's only going to get worse. We have more students. We have a larger population, more people coming into the county. We need to create a successful methods to help everyone communicate in a meaningful two way mm -hmm. so we could resolve this. Because all of it that I've noticed the past two and a half months is the lack of the communication happening. The trust is not there, and we have to focus on that to help guide all these schools, these teachers, these parents. Everybody cares about the kids, so why is it that we can't communicate successfully? And that's all I'm asking today, to look at some means and supports to provide parents, teachers, administrators, and everybody from the bottom all the way up to be more successful in communicating so we could teach our children how to lead. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you Ms. Bergman. Our next speaker is Marion Moore. Good evening, education leaders. Evening. You never truly understand a leader's presence until they make you feel their absence. Thank you, Dr. Dance, for your service and your leadership. Five years ago, blindsided, Dr. Dance and I both had to face challenges with the school system separately yet equally. See, five years ago, when I was teaching, I spoke up about racism and discrimination which adversely affected my family's life. However, I made efforts to reshape a negative situation with the school system into a productive experience. I followed my heart and sharpened my mind, and I studied white supremacy, African history, civil law, as well as educational policies. 
I developed my own tactics to help end the racial and social inequities in education by applying my First Amendment right, as if it could progressively influence the way in which people led. Thus, my vision for school boards nationally is to provide justice for communities regarding discrimination, segregation, and retaliation when reviewing policies and ethics complaints. So here are my final questions of ethics for the board based on my observations. Why is it unethical when a black person liberally uses his or her freedom of, of speech? Um, I'm sorry. Why is it considered unethical? at times when black people use their freedom of speech. But when a white person uses their freedom of speech liberally is accepted. Is it ethical for government officials to demonstrate lawless conduct? Is it legal for white employees to be hired, publicly re uh, recognized, and promoted more than any other race within the organization with such a diverse community? Is it legal for the ethics review panel to not give discrimination complaints equal protection of the law? Is it ethical for the Board of Ed not to be held accountable for violating its own policies? Is it legal to segregate children from schools in certain academic programs or give harsher discipline to students because of their race? Is it legal to observe some religious holidays on your calendar? Is it ethical to blame the superintendent for the total condition of the school system without acknowledging the political decisions that were made before his arrival? Is it ethical for the government to use black leaders with charisma as a distraction to the public while executing an economic and political agenda that will further oppress black and poor people? Finally, is it ethical for you to laugh and be entertained by people like me when they, when their human and civil rights are violated? Even after the Brown versus Board of Education ruling, white supremacy still exists, dividing us by race and segregating us by social and economic status through our education system. So let's not be defeated by our division. <coughs> But when, by continuing Dr. Dance's efforts to lead with equity, because it is the ethical thing to do. Thank you, Ms. Moore. Our last speaker is David Green. Mr. Green. <coughs> Good evening. Good evening. I was struck at the last meeting by uh, Marisol Johnson's a comment she made during the transportation briefing. Um, she said that uh, she had received the most complaints about transportation issues, <coughs> but uh, she, quote, knew the least about it. Think about that for a second. Isn't it the first <coughs> job, shouldn't it be the first job of a, of a board member to th go tot up all the complaints and look at the biggest pile and learn about it? Um, so I, that bothered me a little, and then I said, well, if she's not focusing on the, her constituents' largest complaints, what is she thinking about and focusing on? A clue to that is a statement she made about uh, Verlita White um, that didn't bother me a lot, but it, it, I think is illustrative of what she focuses on. Uh, she said, uh, black girl magic. Um, <coughs> And I think Ms. Johnson too often has focused in this committee on issues of race, gender, and ethnicity. I'd like to see less of that. Um, and I think to a certain degree, uh, her focus on that was divisive and damaging to the school system and the board. So uh, to all of you who are remaining on the board, what, what's an appropriate focus that might be a little different? Well, I think it's important for board members to have a little distance from the superintendent, to have a little bit more formality than she had in making that statement, uh, to be supportive of the superintendent, but to also have a critical eye when a critical eye is needed. And we saw an example during that transportation meeting of a need for a critical eye. Um, during the briefing, it, it's kind of beyond my comprehension but how do you give a briefing on the subject of something that's about 80% logistics without providing any numbers? And thankfully, uh, quite a number of you on the board started asking questions. What are the numbers? What's the baseline? Well, and it wasn't accept 
it wasn't acceptable to me that the board, uh, that the response that we got was that, with a, well, we don't have the data yet from the computer system. If you want to find out what the travel times are for the bus system, all you have to do is go to a meet. you don't need a computer, all you have to do is go to a meeting of all the bus drivers and ask them how long it takes them to drive the, from the beginning of their route to the end of the route. So you don't need a computer to collect that data. Um, so I, I guess uh, in, in summary, I'd, I'd like to see you guys focus on what the big problems are. And um, I guess I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Green. That concludes our public comment. Our next item on our agenda, item N, uh, is third readings of policies. And for that, I call on Ms. Johnson. Thank uh, you. Point of order, Mr. Chairman. Uh, before uh, my colleague, Ms. Johnson, goes, I do have some uh, suggested edits to some of the policies that will be presented this evening. Uh, but in order to permit our board an opportunity to consider fully these changes, and in light of the lengthy agenda tonight, I will submit them in writing prior to or at second reader. Thank you, Ms. Johnson. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chair and members of the board, the Board of Education's Policy Review Committee asked that the board accept the committee's recommendation concerning amendments to the board's ethics codes policies, uh, policies 8360, 8361, 8362, 8363, 8364, and 8365. These amendments are presented to you on tonight's board agenda as Exhibit N. The committee considered public comments received by the boards uh, by the at the board's May 9th meeting. Thank you, Ms. Johnson. Do I have a motion to adopt the recommendations of the Policy Review Committee? So moved. I don't think we need a second. Uh, any discussion? Mrs. Causey. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, regarding Policy 8360, if uh, I could have a review from um, Ms. Johnson or Ms. Howie, who is our um, PRC Committee staff attorney, um, go back over two issues. One is on the first policy, 8360, page 1, paragraph 1A, where being removed is the, the um, personnel called consultants of the Baltimore County Public Schools and the board's volunteer appointees to its panels and councils. Are you asking why they're being removed or the specific? Yes, because I agree with the adding clarification of that candidates to be members of the school board and the superintendent um, is a good idea, but I do not agree that consultants to our school system and also um, our volunteers on its panels, including our ethics review panel, our um, advisory councils, they should also be held uh, responsible for the ethics code. It's certainly up to the board as to whether or not they want to include these these persons in the policy, but given the, the fact that these are volunteers, the recommendation of staff was to exclude them from the policy and from the mandate. Well, I would move that we add them back in. I think it's important that uh, our stakeholders and our taxpayers and our community members um, understand that even if you're a volunteer here on the board, we are volunteers, um, that we are also held to uh, the standard of the ethics code because they are contributing to making decisions that impact our students and our teachers and our families. Mm -hmm. I would. Uh, so, Mrs. Johnson, please. I would disagree. So I was there on just the other day at the um, Volunteer of the Year award ceremony, and the amount of volunteers that we have in this county who, who um, we had hours of, upon hours of, of volunteers that come to schools, that come to our board meetings, that come to a variety of events, and if we start holding them accountable for things that the board does, it will greatly deteriorate the amount of volunteers that we have. So I think that's one of the reasons that we took it out of the, the policy. So uh, you have a motion to deal with 8360. Um, does anyone else want to pull any of the other uh, item policies from this discussion, or is it just 8360? First, then, let's 
I also have an issue with policy 8364 that dovetails with my next point on policy 8360. Okay, so let's deal with 8361, 8362, 8363, and 8365. There's a motion to accept the PRC's recommendations. I think I'd rather have a deal with these issues first and then make sure staff uh, says that, that anything that may change with these may not need to be changed in the others. Because my second point is a, is different. All right. Do you have any comments about the ones I just listed? I'm going to ask staff if they have uh, if they would consider having to change anything based on my next point. So I would just. All right. So 8360. There's a motion a to re to return to the uh, paragraph one capital A, the bracketed phrase consultants of the Baltimore County Public Schools and the board's volunteer appointees to its panels and councils here and after school system official. Is there a second? Second. There's a second. Any discussion? Mrs. Miller. Yeah, I, I agreed with Marisol's point about not wanting to scare off our volunteers, but um, this indicates to the panels and councils. So I think if we specified um, some of our councils are public bodies, so they have been, I guess it's legislatively authorized. <laughs> Um, so I think that it would be then appropriate for them to be covered under the ethics code as well, and that would be not just volunteers, but the leadership of those public bodies. I, to clarify, I'm only asking back to put, I'm only asking to put back the language that was taken out, not to add any other, I, which I, is consultants. I just read the bracket. Okay. That's right. right. Well, Ms. Johnson's comment about no, but your motion is to replace the language that I just read, and now there's a second, and now there's discussion on that. Any further discussion? Ms. Brett. Um, I actually have a question about Marisol's comment. I'm just wondering if this is the status quo policy, how are we, um, how would adding back in the language scare away volunteers? Uh, because, well, now that we're, it's, it's up for policy review, I think that there's more actual, there's more people are taking notice to these, to these sort of policies and what's going on. We've, we obviously know there's a lot of public input on things. And so now that it's here, and there was a reason that this was requ requested to be taken out of the policy, and now that it's been brought to light, I think that it will scare away some of the volunteers that, that we've, we've really gained over the last couple of years. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, any further? Mrs. Henn. Thank you. I disagree um, with Ms. Johnson's comments. Uh, volunteers should be motivated to be part of the system because we do hold them to the same ethical standards that we hold ourselves to, and if they do not, then are those volunteers we want in our system? Mrs. Causey. This is not applying to all volunteers that come to read or that come to a chaperone field trips. It is consultants of the Baltimore County Public Schools and the board's volunteer appointees to its panels and councils. All right. Mrs. Miller, we'll vote after your Actually, comment. Actually, uh, that pretty much covers my comment. Okay, all in favor of the motion made by Mrs. Causey to return uh, the bracketed language in paragraph 1A of 8360, please raise your hands. The motion fails. All right. Um, we'll go ahead and do these one at a time, I guess. Uh, all in favor of the policy as recommended by 80, 80 policy 8360 as recommended by PRC, please Excuse raise your hands. Excuse me, I had a second point on this policy. All right, Mrs. Causey, on the same policy. Yes, on the same policy, okay. 8360, if turning to page two, paragraph C, new language says, candidate to be a member of the school board means a person who has filed for election to the Board of Education of Baltimore County. This year, in uh, or in the coming year, 2018, will be the first time that Baltimore County um, will have elections for its Board of Education members. So there's two processes that were uh, started by a new law. One of them is board members running for election in their councilmanic district, and the other is a, by appointment by the governor through a nomination process. So my question 
to our legal staff is does this paragraph C cover those candidates that would be going through the nominating process and then finally appointed by the governor? Because I'll, I think I'll speak for it. It, it says it, it talks about people who have filed for election. So only people who have filed for election, not people who are part of the commission process, does this concern. Okay, then I would like either um, Mr. Nussbaum or Ms. Howie to um, add language that would be appropriate so that candidates being considered through the nominating process for appointment by the governor also um, be covered in filing their ethics right, financial. So, so if they that, could come up with the language I'll for that. I'll take that as a motion to amend paragraph 2C uh, to also include persons who are seeking appointment through the commission. Is there a second? Second. There's a motion and a second. Is there any discussion on that? Mrs. Miller. I think that might go beyond what is typically required in, I mean, I don't, it's not required in law for appointees to file um, a, a uh, financial, fi thank you, financial disclosure statement. So um, I think that goes a little too far, so I would not support that. All right, any further discussion? I just think it would put all of the candidates for the school board on equal level and also to let the nominating um, commission know that they're willing to do that, which okay. is going to be required of them eventually. All right, all in favor of the motion to amend paragraph 2C of policy 8360 to add reference to persons who are being considered by uh, the commission, please raise your hand. The motion fails. Any other motions regarding 8360? Seeing none, all in favor of 8360 as recommended by the PRC, uh, please raise your hands. That motion carries. 8361 is next. Any comments about proposed changes to policy 8361? Seeing none, all in favor of policy 8361 as recommended by PRC, please raise your hands. That motion carries 8361. Next is proposed changes to policy 8362. Are there any recommendations, any comments about the uh, proposed revisions to policy 8362? Seeing none, all in favor, please raise your hands. Policy 8362, as recommended with revisions by PRC, passes. Next is Policy 8363. Are there any suggestions or comments about Policy 8363? Seeing none, all in favor of Policy 63, as recommended to be amended by the PRC, please raise, raise your hands. Those policy changes are accepted. Next is policy 8364. Are there any suggested changes to the policy recommendations coming from the PRC? Mrs. Causey. I just would like um, Mr. Nussbaum and Ms. Howie to confirm that paragraph one will apply to Board of Education members that come through the nominating process. It, rec it refers to all members of the Board of Education. So that would be persons who get to the Board of Education by any means. Any further comments? All right, all in favor of the policy recommendation, the policy revision recommendations of the PRC on policy 8364, please raise your hand. All right, that policy revision also passes. Next is policy 8365. Are there any comments about the suggested changes to policy 8365. Seeing none, all in favor of the recommended changes from the PRC on policy 8365, please raise your hand. That also carries. Thank you, members of the board, and thank you, Ms. Johnson. Mr. Chair, thank you. could I make a comment on the ethics policies? Mrs. Miller. Um, now, I noticed that 8366, which is the only other policy, did not come up this time because it was considered I think in the last year, year and a half. But I would like to ask the PRC to consider bringing that policy back because I think that it needs to be reviewed 
Um, the issue that I'm concerned with is that there isn't really a way for someone making a, a, an ethics complaint to be able to um, take issue with the opinion of the ethics review panel. There's a process, but they're not able to see their decision, so they really have no basis then to make a complaint you know, or an objection. Very good. I'll take that as a recommendation by a board member that the PRC uh, revisit that. Um, next on our agenda is item O, the Victory Villa Elementary School boundary, and for that I invite Dr. Brown. So um, I'd like to start with uh, the policy, the board policy, which um, is explicit on, on two points. One, uh, that the board look at efficient use of facilities and resources um, regarding the, the decision, and that the board consider community input in the process. The, uh, following the policy, um, the committee is also guided by considerations that are outlined in <coughs> Rule 1280. With regard to elementary and middle school boundaries, uh, there are seven considerations that we ask folks to weigh as they consider uh, the boundary process. Those include, um, again, maintaining the continuity of neighborhoods, um, maintaining, the maintaining or increasing the diversity of the student body across the region, um, the impact of transportation uh, in that regard, um, the <coughs> Minimizing the number of times that any student would be transferred between uh, buildings uh, or would be required to move. Efe efficient use of capacity across those, which aligns very well with, with uh, the policy as well. Long-term enrollment uh, and capacity, so considering projections in that process. And the location of the feeder school patterns. Uh, these are the things that the committee, as it goes through this process, consistently considers as they go through. With regard to the Victory Villa process, um, there were eight, eight schools involved in that process. Uh, they met seven times. They considered 14 potential um, scenarios as, as they worked through that process. And they repeatedly uh, considered input from the community. Um, matter of fact, as we went through this process, uh, really even when we got to the public hearing, uh, the, the constituents who showed up for the public hearing largely organized into three groups. You heard folks from the ORMS community who wanted Planning Block 25 to remain with ORMS. You heard folks from Vincent Farms and Planning Block 68, uh, Wampler Road area, saying they wanted to stay with Vincent Farms. And you also heard um, some uh, conversation around Planning Block 38, uh, which uh, the principal from Shady Spring had mentioned that he would, would have liked to have seen that planning block move uh, in conjunction with other planning blocks that had relatively high numbers of Hispanic students who are second language learners. Those, every one of those uh, concerns was actually addressed in one or more of the scenarios that came before uh, the committee along the way. There were options that addressed each of those. With respect to ORMS, uh, initially the, the boundary for ORMS uh, the consideration, the first scenarios, had that boundary placed at Compass Road. Compass Road demarcates the line between the walk zone and those students then who, who ride a bus to arms. Uh, following the first couple of meetings, adjustments were made that, that moved that, um, or created scenarios that moved that boundary between playing blocks 25, 26, and 27, moving it away from Compass Road and, and preserving more of the arms community in the process. Following the public hearing, uh, or pardon me, the uh, public information session, 
at which there were two options that were presented that had the boundary breaking at Compass Road and two options that had it breaking at Planning Block 25. Following that and following the input of the Orms community, two additional options were, were created that uh, retained then Planning Block 25 within uh, the Orms community. So I just want you to, to be aware that throughout this process, um, community input was repeatedly considered and when you look at the last six scenarios that were considered and fully vetted against all seven of those criteria that I outlined against you, you will see that those six scenarios had two with respect to arms that broke at Compass Road, two that broke at planning, between planning block 25, 26, and 27, and two that basically preserved uh, the original boundary um, for arms. You'll see that half the scenarios uh, kept uh, planning block 38 together with the other planning blocks around Franklin Boulevard. And you'll see that about half the scenarios uh, actually involve leaving plan block 68 in Vincent Farms. So I want, want, want it to be clear that as the committee went through this work, they were very attentive to feedback from the community. So, yeah, and then the last, in the last two sessions, like I said, the committee looked at six complete scenarios. They vetted them against all seven criteria from beginning to end and they weighed, weighed that and in the end came down to two um, scenarios that they, they considered and they voted on. And in the end they voted for option D1. Based on um, a request from the board, we, are, we um, and my staff chose to look at uh, the impacts of moving a couple of planning blocks. Um, the board had requested, well what would be the impact if we move planning block 25 back into dorms. So if we went with the community's recommendation, the committee's recommendation, we took plan, um, D1 and we moved planning block 25 back into D1, what would be the impact? And what would happen if we moved planning block 38 out? So we looked at those things in conjunction with one another and we also looked at them separately. So this is, um, the committee's recommendation for the boundaries for D1 and those two highlighted red circles that I just pulled up actually show the locations for planning block 25 uh, which is within the original ORMS boundary and shows then another circle uh, up where planning block 38 is. Uh, it was originally in Shady Spring and then was um, in this iteration recommended to go into uh, ORMS. Option D1A considers both of those things. So again, if we look in D1A, um, planning block 38 is moved back into Shady Spring so that those four planning blocks uh, that are adjacent to one another on Franklin Boulevard uh, are moved together or kept together. And planning block 25 is moved back from Middlesex into Orms. Option D1B on the other hand, leaves planning block 25 with Middlesex and only moves planning block uh, 38 back to Shady Springs. Now logically there is a fourth permutation here. That, that fourth permutation would include moving planning block 38 and planning block 25 both back into ORMS uh, but frankly that so severely overcrowds ORMS uh, taking it to 147 percent of capacity that I didn't run it in the rest of the computations after that. I stuck with these three uh, which I think are the more reasonable solutions. So what's the impact of this? So not surprisingly this uh, is neutral to five of the eight schools. We're only moving two playing blocks so it impacts only Shady Spring, <coughs> Orms, and Middlesex and so we'll highlight those and, and take out the others. What you see is that if we move planning block 25 back into ORMS and planning block 38 out of ORMS, that's option D1A, Middlesex would come in at 79.9 percent of its capacity. ORMS on the other hand would come in at over 135 percent of its capacity and Shady Springs, Shady Spring would come in at about 112 percent of capacity. 
In option D1B, where we only move uh, planning block um, 38 out, but we leave planning block 25 with middle sex, you see that um, in terms of middle sex, we come in at 91.5. The overcrowding at Orms is not as severe, coming in at 116. And then uh, the overcrowding again at Shady Springs is reduced somewhat from its current state, which is over 130% down to 112%. Naturally, the question arises uh, then, what's the impact in terms of ethnicity at the buildings? You'll see that uh, the options in terms of the ethnic makeup of the building, uh, buildings are relatively stable, with the largest swing being for ORMS, ranging from 40 to 45% minority status, depending on the option. The same is true if we look at free and reduced rice, price lunch. Uh, that is a relatively neutral impact on free and reduced price lunch. Of course, uh, there's a question about special permission transfers. Um, we know that there's a fairly large number of special permission transfers at ORMS. So the question then becomes what happens if those special permission transfers or when those special permission transfers come out of ORMS? I want to put a caveat in front of these numbers. These numbers are based on current enrollment. They do not take into account the projection. So it's based on current enrollment. What you can see is that based on current enrollment, when the, when the boundary goes in place in the 18-19 school year, rec recommendation D, D1 would come in at roughly 118%. D1A would come in at, at 126 percent, and D1B would come in at about 106 percent. If I recall right, I can't see it from here. One of, thank you. It's a long ways to look up there right now. <laughs> uh, and you can see. Can I ask for a clarification there? Because sure. you said it's based on the current enrollment. Did you mean the current boundaries? It's based on the current live-in enrollment based on the planning blocks that would be used to construct the boundary. And live in means what? So if we look at the planning blocks, those are the students who actually live in those planning blocks. Not we also take the them to the account the special permission transfers, which you then see us backing out of that number. So you can see that, that um, by the 22-23 school year, when the current kindergartners would matriculate out of the building, by then all the special permission transfers would be out. You can see that in two of the scenarios, you come in slightly under capacity, and one you come in at about 108% of capacity. So moving on, the caveat that I put there is it is important to realize that that is based, again, on current enrollment. There are trends that are associated with enrollment for these buildings that, that need to be taken into account and were taken into account with the, the committee process as well. So with respect to the ORMS boundary, under all these scenarios, D1, D1A, D1B, the boundary for ORMS is getting larger. Okay? Under, under that scenario, we are adding planning blocks to, to ORMS. It's just a question of how much larger we make it. As the current projections for ORMS have it um, on track to get more overcrowded over time. So the special permission transfers will not entirely offset that difference in the long run. ORMS, with its current boundary, is projected to grow. We are adding planning blocks to it, which means that it is more likely to come in more overcrowded over time. Middlesex is just the opposite. Middlesex, the boundary is actually shrinking. Middlesex is projected to go down over time. And therefore, we can expect that if Middlesex comes in low with a boundary, that that's going to get worse with time. So it's pretty important to get these boundaries as close as possible uh, for both Middlesex and ORMS to our desired outcome so that we are not um, subsequently impacted by increases uh, or decreases tied to uh, trends in enrollment. Mm -hmm. So finally, again, this boundary committee uh, considered uh, was comprised of eight buildings, uh, represented over 4,000 students in this process. Um, they were very attentive 
to the community input, repetitively content, uh, uh, considerate of the community input. When we go through these processes, um, and in this case, we're adding 490, 409 seats to the region. It's a wonderful opportunity to balance enrollment for the region. But it requires that people change. It requires that uh, people go to different schools. And I deeply respect how difficult that is for people. Uh, and the Orms community has been very articulate about how difficult that is for them. Um, but that being said, again, um, all voices were considered in this process. Adjustments were based on feedback. Repetitive adjustments were based on feedback. And again, all options were considered fully against the seven criteria. That being said, uh, you know, the committee recommended option D1 to the Board of Education of Baltimore County Sc Public Schools for adoption uh, and implementation in the 2018-2019 school year. Okay. Um, is there a motion on uh, uh, this matter to approve the boundary committee's um, recommendation of D1 for Victoryville Elementary School? Is there a motion on any, in any regard? I'll make a motion. Mr. Virch. Um, I move that uh, the board adopt um, the D1 option with an amendment. And I'm happy to articulate that amendment. Go right ahead. Well, I think there needs to be a second. Well, no, it has to, we have to know what your motion is. Excellent. The, um, the amendment to option D1 would be to um, place planning block 38 back in the boundary of uh, the Shady Spring Elementary School and planning block 25 back within the boundary for Orms Elementary School. All right. Uh, is there a second to that motion? Second. Second. All right. And if I may be heard. You may. Um, thank you, Mr. Gillis. Um, this is a very serious matter for our board to consider. As you've heard, eight schools were engaged in this process. Um, unarticulated, uh, perhaps until tonight, is that this really spanned two of our districts, uh, my own and uh, June Eaton's. Um, in fact, on one day, June and I went to both Orms and to, uh, to Middlesex. Um, uh, the committee members, the board members that I've spoken with, all have been very, very attentive and all have been very serious in the conversations that I have had with you, and I appreciate the attention that you have devoted to this. Uh, when we've met, I have said that during one of the public sessions, because of the diverse nature of our school system, uh, one of our schools, Shady Springs, has a sizable Hispanic American population. And uh, the principal from the school, um, without taking a position as to where, articulated the following, that there are three planning blocks within his school's current boundary where there are significant numbers of Hispanic American students. At his school, he has a paraeducator who is a native of Columbia, a former a uh, long-term substitute for our system who works very, very effectively with these students. The, three, the students in these three planning blocks, their families interact, they're close, they're supportive. And the principal's suggestion, because the principal doesn't vote, he doesn't direct, his suggestion was whatever the committee does, that these three planning blocks should be kept together. Now, that was articulated. Uh, Dr. Brown, who I've come to know quite well, um, used the term fully vetted. That's actually a subjective observation on his part, although much of what he's presented to our board, I believe, has been very, very objective. The numbers speak for themselves, and I thank him for his patience during many of our conversations. But as to this specific suggestion and whether it was fully recognized at the time, that is a subjective judgment in my view. The principal suggested wherever it goes, please keep these three planning blocks together. 
the number of students, um, uh, to my recollection, is in the neighborhood of approximately 30 or so students. I have my map, and I can certainly open it up, but you all have seen the map before. 34 and planning block 38. Exactly. <laughs> Um, that having been said, then, th that planning block 38 would now go to Orms Elementary School. And it would not be with the adjoining planning blocks that the principal suggested to the committee. That is the first part of this motion. The other part of this same motion is that planning block 25 is an essential part of the Arrow Acres neighborhood and has been since the community, the neighborhood was built in the 1940s. The number of students as shown on the map are 60. And as a continual uh, theme through the meetings and um, even in the second stage of this process, which we have to remind ourselves is actually a multi-stage process. There are the public meetings uh, that are held as part of the boundary process. That's about four months of very hard work, intense work by committee members. Then there is a recommendation and a public hearing, and many of the members of our board attended this public hearing. The process didn't stop with the recommendation there was required a public hearing. Um, thirdly, there is the final stage. And in the rule, it's referred to as final action. And that is the board's role. That is where we are now. The process didn't stop. It continued until this final stage. And as I thought, all the work that was done, the 4,000 students whose needs were reviewed and contemplated, when one adds the 34 and one adds the uh, 60 students, before us now, in the absence of any other motion, are these 94 students and where they would go based on the information that I've shared with you. But the rule that's in place today, the rule that was utilized by the committee the rule that was still in existence during the public hearing and what we have to work with, I think we should look to see, do these two planning blocks, can they, do they fall within any of the considerations as outlined by the superintendent's rule? And to my mind, planning block 38 falls under, um, at a minimum, um, the B criteria in the rule that relates to maintaining or increasing uh, diversity among schools. And I think planning block 25, if ever there was meaning to the term continuity of neighborhood, then it fits under that heading. Now, not all the planning blocks, the reasons given for why they should be moved can to my mind, easily fit under criteria. But this is the criteria that was being utilized by folks. Now, there are, in these criteria, these considerations, there is a weighing that occurs. And of over 4,000 students and where they should go, we are now left with, based on my motion, 94 and where it would be best under this rule for these students to go. And that is what has caused me to make this motion. It's an area that I'm very familiar with, and I'm happy to answer any questions from any of my colleagues. Mr. Stewart. So point of order and clarity, the motion that you are making is, but correct me if I'm wrong, and Dr. Brown, D1B. please chime in, is D1A as it relates to the presentation here. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? correct. So, I just want this board to be sure. clear that in understanding what Mr. Birch is discussing, it is D1A. Right. And what I was referring to, if I may, what I was referring to with D1 is actually what the recommendation was, because there is a map that exists, and that's what was recommended. Right. So it is a amendment, as you know, to that. Thank you. Another point of, of clarity or question of clarity for Dr. Brown is 
under D1B, we are moving 34 students back to Shady Spring in Planning Block 38, is that correct? Correct. And they're majority of a Latino population. Correct. Correct. So that only affects the diversity or percent minority by four percentage points at ORMS. That's, even though that's a significant percentage of diverse students. Correct. So just uh, as far as my analysis goes, I would like the board to kind of weigh those options and understand that if we did want to make a modification and the principal spoke, um, I think, very reasonably about trying to keep these students together to provide the best resources possible, I understand the efficacy of perhaps looking at a D1B option here. Uh, I'm not sure I say, share the same zeal uh, with respect to D1A, however. Mrs. Causey. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I would like to thank our staff who's worked very hard and diligently um, on this boundary process and also on the community members that participated. It was a great deal of time and effort and um, we've heard from many, many, many of you and that's a wonderful thing. Um, as my fellow board member, Mr. Virch, has pointed out, this is part of the process and continuing to deliberate on what we heard at the board hearing is a part of the process, so I um, I'm applaud my fellow board member for continuing in diligent work around this issue. It is not easy when people are considering changes to their families and their children um, and their neighborhoods, and that's a given, but we do want to take the time to see if this is, in fact, the best boundary for the system moving forward. Um, I would also like to take the point to say that it, it, I also consider it objective to say that each of the six original options were completely vetted um, because I disagree with that. In fact, I still at this point do not have uh, specific information on under the rule what's listed here as item C, the impact of transportation and pedestrian patterns on students. For instance, we have not been given any information about how many of these students moving from one school, being moved from one school to another, how, how many of them are, have to be bused versus walk now, and if they were bused before and they're being bused now, what is that additional transportation time? We have no concept of how many additional bus miles are being added by moving students from one school to another. Um, and some may say, oh, well, that's not that big of a deal, except just tonight we've heard in public comment from our Northeast Area Advisory uh, representative that transportation is a huge issue. It's a logistical issue. It's a safety issue. We've heard complaints about bullying and violence on buses. So it's not an insignificant thing to say little Johnny or little Tyrell is going to be on the bus for 15 extra minutes or be on a bus when right now they walk to school. So that, in my mind, is a very significant issue. It's not been properly detailed, outlined to the board, and if someone got some report that I didn't get, please let me know. So I would uh, suggest that we should consider the contiguity of neighborhoods where students are walking, able to walk to the schools, um, that that be given a high priority. Um, just recently, a law was changed for in the state of Maryland that increased uh, the Board of Eds around the state, their liability in the case of accidents um, from $100,000 to up to $400,000. So it's not insignificant if your child's on a, in a bus and in an accident, if they have injury, that those families may actually have to bear some of the burden depending on how many students are on that bus, how severe were their injuries. So again, riding a bus, extra minutes across a, a busy intersection is not an insignificant thing. Um, so I would suggest that it is important for the board to reflect on that. One of the other aspects about walking um, being better for students and communities is that it gives families a better opportunity to engage in their students' education, and also if they need any sort of wraparound services, that they are more able to go into that 
uh, school locally, closely, uh, familiarly, and uh, receive the services they need. We just heard from uh, the president of TABCO tonight that she's encouraged about us moving to community school models in the future. And that's one of the things where in a walking community that families can really uh, be better able to participate in their child's education. So I would just uh, say thank you, Steve, for all your work. Mr. McDaniels. Thank you, Mr. Gillis. Um, I'd like to say that I, too, uh, am supportive of the modifications that Mr. Virch has proposed. Um, I think uh, we are respecting the work of the committee. Um, I think theoretically, uh, keeping Planning Block 38 where it is has some merit, and also there's merit um, with the requests of the Orem community. However, I am uh, significantly concerned about where that D1A option would leave uh, Middlesex and, you know, one of the criteria is the uh, capacity utilization of all the schools. And um, at 79 or close to 80 percent at Middlesex, and uh, the information that Dr. Brown gives about an increasing population at Orem's projected, um, I just want the board to be responsible. But, but I will say again, I do agree with both of the motivations that are a part of, of, of Mr. Virch's amendment. Um, but uh, even with the Southwest um, redistricting we did, we left a school that was not as utilized as perhaps we would, and I just don't want us to make a similar error here. I'd like to comment uh, after listening to um, uh, Dr. Brown and to many board members, and that is that uh, obviously the area is overcrowded, and obviously uh, there was a need for additional seats, and almost Everyone loves the fact that there's going to be a new school. Um, but new schools and added seats uh, make for tough decisions. Um, and I think that these decisions uh, really should be um, loyal to the, the process uh, and that the community commitment um, uh, that's, uh, that's been shown in the process. So if it's in uh, the board's uh, view to um, uh, tweak uh, D1, I would suggest that the best process would be uh, to move to return this process to the committee with recommendation that it study D1A and D12, uh, D1B and come back to us with its recommendation so that the decision is the community's decision and not this board's decision. Mr. Yulfelder. I have a question, uh, I just want to make sure I'm reading this correctly. On the chart comparison of options, uh, do I understand or my reading is correctly when it says option D1A that ORMS would increase uh, in utilization 135.5 percent over capacity? Is that correct? Am I reading that correctly? Um, you are reading what's shown. The I think the more relevant one, not to distract in the least, is the uh, chart which indicates, and that's uh, page 13 in the handout. I don't read numbers. What, which, yeah, I that's, uh, it's 13. It's, it's the Orms Elementary School, and it shows you after the special oh, right. commission transfers. Okay. That is the And directing your attention to the first line below the blue line where boundary change implemented is shown. If you go across you see the three options. Option D1A shows a lower figure. The figure speaks for itself, but it is not the 135% red figure. 126. Exactly. Mr. Stewart. So this is the five to six years out. It looks like it will be at 114 to 106. Uh, I recall Dr. Brown suggesting that perhaps the trends at Orms were not going to be so simple to identify going forward, but I'm not sure if you could comment on that. So, uh, thank you, Mr. Stewart. Um, you are correct. Um, you know, one of the challenges when we do the boundary process, we have to base it on where students are currently. 
What we do know, however, is that with the current boundary of Orms, which is smaller than this, the boundary that's being proposed even with modification, um, that, that, that boundary, or pardon me, that population is predicted to grow. And likewise, the Middlesex boundary, which is actually larger now and will get smaller, it was actually projected to decline. Um, so it makes the interpretation of this set of numbers a little, I would be a little cautious on this. I'm not convinced that it will come in this low. All right, Mr. Virch. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Gillis. Um, I just wanted to make a comment. Uh, the observation was made with regard to the current utilization of our uh, Middlesex Elementary School, um, a school that incidentally does a very, very fine job with students. It has a very dedicated administration and staff, um, as do all the schools in the boundary study. Um, but I would note that that 79.9, as my colleague Chuck said, 80, it really, it's 70, the number speaks for itself. But one can travel just down the road from the most overcrowded school in the boundary study area, just down the road at Oliver Beach. The current utilization as we sit in our chairs today is 73%. So please don't think that there's some effort afoot to close a school. In fact, I think we all would have liked to see a higher utilization given the overcrowded nature of Vincent Farm, but that school, for a variety of reasons, was not included as part of this Victory Villa boundary study. And the fact is there are two other elementary schools that may be able to mutually resolve their own future projected overcrowding. But the idea that a school such as Middlesex would be operating at some grossly inefficient level, um, that's not, I believe, a reasonable interpretation. And lastly, with all predictions, they are just that. And we try our best with them, and we weigh these. And in fact, the long-term projections are, in fact, one of the criteria identified under the rule. And it is couched in those terms. I thank my colleague Chuck for bringing that to folks' attention because it is something that we have to be mindful of and, of course, in our decision-making, will be held accountable for. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks. I think we've had uh, substantial discussion on this issue, and I think the recommendation, the motion, I'm sorry, is, uh, is what uh, Dr. Brown called D1A, but it is D1 with, with uh, 25 and 38 returned to Orem's. Is that... That's correct, Mr. Chairman. Or strike that, 38 return to Shady Spring, Sorry, yes. 25, yes. A, a useful change. Yeah, thank you for, for catching my, my error there. Um, so we've had discussion on that, and it's time for a vote. All in favor of the motion, please raise your hands. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. The motion carries um, with eight votes. Um, Thank you all for that discussion and for uh, your commitment to the, uh, making certain that the process is fully vetted. Next on our agenda is item P, uh, personnel matters, and for that I invite um, Dr. Mayo. Good evening, Chairman Gillis. Uh, before we start, Dr. Mayo, Mr. Yulefelder asked for a moment to yeah, comment I'd like, on I'd the like process. Yeah, I'd like us to think in terms of the process of the, in this particular boundary case. Um, when I first got on the board, the first item was the boundary changes for West Towson. And believe it or not, in nine years, uh, the same you, arguments uh, are being made today as they were nine years ago. Every one thing we know, every parent is parochial about their school and their child and mainly does not really care about what is best for our system. Um, during the course of, of this boundary study, we heard from several people who um, alluded to the fact that the process was flawed in some ways. Um, the present 1280 that, that we are using right now was developed after a couple of years of reviewing the process that we previously had for determining boundary, boundary changes. And I would suggest perhaps that, that we go back and look at 1280 again, taking into consideration some of the comments were made 
that are either validated or not validated. And if possible, uh, we take 1280 and see if we can perfect it even more. Certainly it is not perfected now. So I would suggest that perhaps uh, that take. be taken by PRC as a study to really get underway and let's see if we can perfect it even We'll take that as now. a recommendation that PRC reconsider that um, rule or policy as well, policy as well. Um, Dr. Mayo. Good evening, Chairman Gillis, Vice Chairwoman Johnson, Ms. Prumo, members of the board. I'll lay board consideration for the following personnel matters. Um, retirements, resignations, leaves of absence, and deceased recognition of service. All right. Do I have a motion to approve the personnel matters as presented in P1 through P4? So moved. Second? Second. Second. Any discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 The motion carries. Thank you, Dr. Mayo. Thank you. Next is uh, item Q, which is administrative appointments, and I call on Ms. Prumo. Chairman Gillis and members of the board, Dr. Dance would like to bring forward for your approval the following administrative appointments. Principal Fort Garrison Elementary, Principal Franklin Middle, Principal Millbrook Elementary, Principal Villa Cresta Elementary, and Staff Attorney Office of Law. Do I have a motion to approve the administrative appointments as presented in Exhibit Q1? So moved. Second? Second. Discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 The motion carries. Thank you, Ms. Prumo, it's back to you. Yes. Um, first, we'd like to recognize Hope Byer, Coordinator of School Counseling, who will be Principal of Fort Garrison Elementary. Hope? family or friends with you. And let him stand up and be recognized as well. Second is Ann Gorman, Assistant Principal Shady Spring Elementary, Principal Millbrook Elementary. And any family and friends? Third is Jenny Rohrbaugh, Assistant Principal Villa Cresta to Principal at Villa Cresta. Jenny. And Jenny, family friends with you? And then a welcome to uh, Team BCPS is Ann Run for Sangarun. Um, and I know Ms. Margaret Ann Howie is happy to have her in the Office of Law. <laughs> Let him stand, your husband. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, lastly, Brian Schiffer, who currently is the Director, Office of Fine Arts and Social Studies to Principal Franklin Middle School, Brian. Very good. Thank you, Ms. Prumo. Uh, next on our agenda is item R, which is uh, another new business item, collective bargaining master agreements, and I invite Mr. Duke to come forward. Good evening, Chairman Gillis, Vice Chairman Johnson, Ms. Prumo, members of the board. I would ask the board uh, for its consideration and acceptance of the proposed changes to the master agreement between the Board of Education and our collective bargaining units. I would ask if you would like to vote on each one individually. I think uh, we can vote on them as a group. As a group? Um, that would include uh, the master agreements between the Board of Education and the American Federation of State, County, and Municipal Employees, AFSCME, the Board and the Council of Administrative and Supervisory Employees, CASE, the Education Support Professionals of Baltimore County, ESPBC, BCPS Organization of Professional Employees, or OPE, and the Teachers Association of Baltimore County, TABCO. 
Before I ask for a motion to approve those collective bargaining uh, master agreements, I remind Ms. Bratt that this is a matter on which you do not vote. So is there a motion to approve the collective bargaining master agreement? So moved. Master agreements. So moved. There's a motion and a second. Second. Any discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Motion carries. Mr. Chairman, I'm abstaining on that one. All righty, Mrs. Miller abstains. Thank you, Mr. Duke. Next on our agenda, item S, is contracts. And for that, I call on our contract committee chair, Mr. McDaniels. Thank you, uh, Mr. Gillis. Uh, members of the board's uh, building and contracts committee met earlier this evening and would like to bring items one through five, items seven, items nine through 13, and items 15 through 29 uh, to the board with a recommendation uh, favorably. And um, after discussion, the buildings and contracts committee uh, suggested items six, eight and 14 be delayed and uh, and also item 30 to be delayed uh, for vote for the full board because we, we did not completely discuss item 30, but six, eight and 14 were discussed completely. Very good. First I'll, I'll take your uh, referral um, of the first series of items as the motion for items S1 through five, seven, nine through 13 and 15 through 29. Is there discussion? Can we break out number one and four? All right. Any other matters anyone wants to pull out of that list? Okay, so the motion is now two, three, five, seven, nine through 13, and 15 through 29. Any further, any discussion on those? All in favor, please say aye. Uh, aye. aye. Those contracts are approved. The next one we will go to is contract number one. Uh, Mrs. Miller. Thank you. Um, I want to make sure that I'm reading the summary correctly because sometimes I'm not quite sure. Um, it says that the contract is for $200,000 for a three-month term. Is that correct? Yes. We're, this is an extension of a, an existing contract, so we're requesting um, that it be extended uh, to allow us to re-advertise this, this bid. This is not an. This is not a two hundred thousand dollar three month contract. This is just a three month extension of an existing two hundred thousand dollar contract. Okay. So what? What then is the amount for the? The amount remains the same. Just we're just we're not going to increase spending. It's just an extended three year term, and the money's three have month. not. Three, three month, month yeah. term, and the monies have not fully been expended. Okay, so the two hundred thousand is for a one year term, or what, um, what is that I for? I believe the contract. I don't have it in pulled up right now. Uh, yeah, is um, it was originally a one year. Uh, originally approved yeah, in twenty fifteen. It says uh, sixteen to seventeen. Okay, but the so 200,000 covers one year. This 200,000 covers it's the period for, since June 9th of 2015. It's for the two year period that the prior contract was awarded for. Two year, okay. Because right. that had me a little alarmed when but I saw current three expenditures, months. Current expenditures, even though it's for two years, are only $81,000. Right, okay. This is okay. authority. Um, other questions? I, I do have another question. Uh, how do we find the? Uh, how long have we had this set of a, of attorneys? I know it's been a while. I think one of them was recently replaced. Uh, well, I, at least since 2015, I don't know the entire history, but I know that many of them have served for years. So these persons who are on this list were approved in 2015, when the process. Uh, goes out for bid in three months or in three months from now, there will be an opportunity for others to be added. Right, but this particular set has really been serving in this position for many, many years, I believe. I believe that's correct. And that's really up to the board, correct, to replace them? Or is that yes. my understanding? Okay. All right, thank you. Okay. All in, any other additional, any other questions on, question, on contract one? Mrs. Causey. I'm just going to be abstaining. All right. All in favor of uh, approving contract number one, um, which is RGA, is that right? I'm um, sorry. 
I've already flipped the page. JNI 745-16, please say aye. 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 The motion carries. I'm also abstaining. All righty. Uh, the next one is contract number four. Um, Mrs. Miller. Thank you. I wanted to ask, does this contract cover uh, the chrono system? Work on, work on the chrono system? So just to be sure, we're talking about electronic parts supplies? <laughs> yes. Uh, not to my knowledge, uh, this is a Department of Facilities uh, contract. Let me try to yeah. answer that. The parts that we purchase are for upgrades of intercom, paging, and scheduled clock system, not Kronos system. But not Kronos. Yes. Okay. I wanted to be sure because I know that that has been raised as an issue multiple times. So thank you. All right, any other discussion on contract number four, which is MWE 84413? All in favor, please say aye. 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 The contract is approved. Next is contract number six, which I understand that the contract committee recommended that it be delayed or deferred. Um, uh, uh, you want to address that, Mr. McDaniels, or should we? Well, uh, again, it's a contract that uh, came before the curriculum committee, I guess, to review for content. The curriculum committee supported uh, moving it forward to the full board and then discussion um, in the building and contracts uh, committee. There was additional information requested uh, comparing the performance, if I could summarize, of iReady students to uh, students that uh, were instructed under different types of uh, processes to try to justify the cost of the iReady expenditures. All righty, and the reason for your recommendation of delay is that would you? To get the additional information okay. from staff. So the contract is JMI 618-14, and it concerns the iReady uh, English, uh, I'm sorry, reading instruction software, correct? Correct. Um, and I recall from, uh, from curriculum uh, that the presentation uh, was uh, uh, effusive about the success of the iReady program, uh, yes. but I'll ask you as the chair of curriculum to uh, speak to it. Yes, absolutely. We had a lot, we had a lot of discussion and questions that day, um, and Ms. White and her staff shared the contrast of using iReady, not using iReady, and the, the progression that students have and the individualization that each, each teacher to their students, but maybe Ms. White and her staff can speak sure. to that a little bit more. Thank you, Ms. Johnson. Yes, we were talking about iReady in terms of students making a full year's growth in a half year's time with regard to their reading skills and abilities. We are working with students uh, K through nine with this program in particular. It is a tool that our teachers are using um, to differentiate instruction, to use in small group instruction, not just as an intervention. And so with the, for the board's consideration, one of the things we talked about in the contracts committee had to do with the additional information that the board is looking for, we're still a little vague on what that additional information would be. We have piloted this program. It has been um, proven to be effective for our students. Uh, that information has been shared with the board's curriculum committee. We can certainly share that information with the full board, but in terms of different uh, a different set of data, we would not have that available at the next board meeting. All right. Ms. Causey. Thank you, Ms. White. Uh, I'm on the Building and Contracts Committee, and I reviewed the Curriculum Committee meeting and um, have also um, heard from a number of community um, stakeholders. Um, I had concerns. It's not just an issue if a program works. It's if the program works, how well does it work relative to other programs, especially if it's a program that is extremely expensive? because the increased amount of $2 million is going to be only over a one year and 10 month term. Uh, and when I went back and looked at the BCPS proposed six year instructional digital conversion plan that was given to the board in January of 2017, and uh, it talks about all of the costs of STAT, the network infrastructure, physical classroom, library specifications, one-to-one, -one, and so on, the leases, um, that are adding up, let's see, this year 33 million, next year 41 million, the year after that 51 million. 
And then it comes to curriculum resources, where in 2016-2017, uh, curriculum resources were five million. 224,000, and then the next year they're supposed to remain at 5,224,000. So here we have one contract, which is I ready for two additional million dollars, and then there's another project that we'll be discussing shortly, Dreambox, that's um, another 1,825,000. So it's not just a matter of is this program working, it's is this program working relative to other programs and what is their cost per pupil? Because as we hear at every board meeting, there are incredible unmet needs of our communities. And we're all working very hard to do the best we can with our funding. I'm not saying anyone's egregiously holding back funds, but we have a variety of needs. We've heard about bus transportation. We've heard about social workers and all of these other issues um, that we have. Uh, facilities tonight, we just went through a boundary study and we're gonna be 101% capacity overall and we've already added 400 seats, so there's still a need for, uh, for facilities and, and all the other issues that go along with our school system. So my concern is, what is the cost per pupil? And when you talk about the students making um, such great gains, and that's wonderful, I believe the number was 28% of students. So what we were asking for in the Building um, and Contracts Committee is to have a report given to all of the board members that outlines what were teachers doing in the past because obviously they were doing interventions in the path in, ter in terms of reading and identifying the cost. One of the other contracts we just approved tonight, for instance, that could be used in a comparison um, because apparently a pilot was done with Orton Gillingham, which that contract is only $125,000 a year, but it's supposed to result in um, some really significant gains for our students. So that's the information that we would like, is not just growth, but growth proficiency relative to the pilot, if it was done, what were other teachers doing and what were those gains, so that we can see if it is actually worth the money, and we also have to consider, because I don't understand how it's fiscally sustainable. Oops, I guess your time is up. I was, I was going, really? <laughs> so I'd like to uh, Gillis, respond really if I can. <laughs> but so, the, so, sure. so that's not information, and just as, you know, in the context of this meeting, is not enough time to properly reflect and make a vetted decision. So before, before I ask Mr. Yulfo to comment, I will note that, and maybe Mr. Saris knows, the, uh, the funding source says it's a combination of operating budget and grant monies. Uh, but Mr. Mr. Yulfelder. Um, thank you. Uh, I, I sat in the audience uh, and listened to the um, Buildings Contracts Committee. And uh, I was very moved by the uh, testimony and, and the explanations of our staff uh, who I have high regard for as educators. Uh, now, I, I just wanted to be clear that let's not mix up what you're seeing here with uh, a $600,000 contract to cover uh, maybe 26 or 30 or 50 people. As I remember the numbers that were presented, and I think, I think it'd be better this way, um, I'd like to make a motion uh, to adopt this contract. Ready, is there a second? I second. All right. Thank so you. I speak on. Yeah. Now you Thank you. Point of order, Mr. Chair. We already have a motion from the. No, you have the recommendation. That's not a motion. No, let, just so you're clear, the committees uh, just deliver their recommendations to the board. The contracts come to the board, and now the motion is to accept this contract, which is contract number six, JMI six eighteen fourteen. Mr. Thank Yulvater, continue. Thank you. Um, some numbers that were given, and I'm sure you can bring them up again, were that the present contract uh, covers 26,000 students. Um, and so far we spent, uh, I think it was a million two hundred thousand in those numbers. And over, over um, the two-year period, I, as I understand what some of the explanation was, it comes down to about the $12 or $13 a student. Now, the way I read this, that the modification uh, is necessary because we're going to in, uh, in purchase licenses for students in grades four and five. So my question is, how many additional students uh, are in grades four and five that will be covered by this contract? Uh, that's one thing. The other thing is, it's very difficult to take and 
equate dollars uh, to uh, the progress that, that students make. You know, what is the value of increasing someone's um, learning ability uh, one year, to move them up one year? What, what, is that, what is that worth? Can we put a price on it? I don't think we can. We're here to educate our students. And as I understand it, this is more than just intervention. This is actually a teaching tool. So I would suggest to the board that we follow the advice of our educators uh, in terms of why they think this is necessary to continue in the education of our students. And I would like to hear uh, from some of the individuals who we questioned, who were questioned before. Good. Mrs. Hen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I don't think the value of this tool is up for debate. I think the outcome of the Building and Contracts Committee recommendation to delay the vote on this was as a result of wanting more data. We have a fiscal responsibility. This is a $2 million request. All we're asking for is data that probably already exists that staff have been willing to provide to delay this until our July 11th vote. That's all we're asking for. Mrs. Miller, do you have anything more to add? No, that's Very good. Very good. I think it's time to call this question all in. Mr. Chair. you have something more to add? Yes, I do. Uh, one of the other issues that, um, and, and, and Mr. Ufelder, uh, can we put a price on it? We absolutely have to put a price on it. We have to put a price on everything because we have so many needs across the system for so many students and so many families. Of course we have to put a price on it. Also, it's important to understand what are we getting for that money relative to opportunity costs. Opportunity costs for other types of instruction that might be helpful. Right now, our, um, our park scores are below the state average in I believe it's six out of eight uh, significant indicators. And there are other counties doing other things that perhaps can work as well for less money. And the only reason I would suggest that you look at that is because we have so many unmet needs for our community. And we need to do the best that we can for our students. If we want everyone to learn Spanish, we could send everyone on an immersion program to Spain or Latin America you know, for six months, but we can't afford to do that. So we do other things right. to try and encourage Spanish. Thank you. The other issue, last, is that there are additional ELA and math materials that are going to be discussed in just a few days. So there's going to be additional uh, materials available and costs related to that and I think it would be prudent for us to understand the full range of costs related to what we can do to provide the best for our students. Very good. So the motion uh, is on contract number six which is JMI 618-14 regarding to iReady. All in favor of the contract please raise your hands. One, two, three, one, two, three, four, five. The contract fails. Next is contract number eight, which is JNI I seven seven. Go ahead. To approve the, the contract. JNI seven seven eight fourteen contract modification and extension mathematics supplemental resources. There's a motion to accept the contract. Is there a second? Second. All right. Discussion. Excuse me. Which which this is uh, number eight? Contract number eight JNI seven seven eight regarding Dreambox Learning. Mathematics Supplemental Resources. Dr. Boswell McComas, do you want to address this? Good evening. Uh, this program also likewise falls into the same discussion that we had related to iReady. Um, and I think uh, Mr. McDaniel, if you'd like to share, it was the same conversation in terms of the conflict between what one committee recommended and the other committee recommended. That's, that's correct. That's correct. So the curriculum committee, uh, just to flesh this out, curriculum committee heard this, curriculum committee voted to recommend its approval to the board. Contracts Committee met today, as Mr. Yulfelder did. I sat in the back, and it voted to delay for more information. But do you, I, I'd like you to speak to the board about the, the Dreambox um, learning program. Hey, thank you. I was just unclear exactly what you wanted yeah, me to answer. Yep. Um, so Dreambox is, um, as we've uh, discussed in Curriculum Committee, it is an adaptive program that provides our teachers real-time diagnostic information to guide. Oh. Give you feedback. Oh. Yeah. 
I got karaoke crazy. <laughs> <laughs> it gives our teachers real-time information on where students are performing in terms of their fluency, their compu uh, conceptual uh, understanding, and their critical thinking relative to mathematics. We are able to both gauge where students are in terms of standards that they were behind on, while also moving them forward on standards that they're currently working on on grade level, as well as introducing and move them forward on standards that are above grade level. And so I know in our curriculum committee we shared with you some very specific student examples of where you could look at a student's data set and see exactly where they were working on uh, skills and understandings from prior grade levels that they still struggled with. And that pairing that opportunity to recover and practice their skill set while simultaneously working with the teacher on grade level um, really is a powerful opportunity for our students. It is not uh, just intervene and recover um, skills that they are behind on. It is a matter of critical time for our students to both catch them up while we're moving them forward. What I do ask that our board understand is that these diagnostic tools are tools that we did not have for educators 10 and 15 years ago. This type of information would have been done manually prior to the efficiency that this type of technology allows us. And so just as when you go to your physician, I, I think about about in this comparison. When I go for my annual checkup, if I have not gone for my blood work ahead of time, the doctor does not have the critical information to have a meaningful conversation in the limited time that we have together, right? And so if we don't provide our teachers with the critical data to make the most of their small group and one-on-one -on -one time with our students and our whole group, we are in fact disadvantaging their ability to make critical decisions in real time to move our students forward no matter where they are. And and that applies to the Dreambox as well as any other adaptive uh, instructional tool. Good. I'll, rec I'll, I'll remind the board uh, that this is part of an approved budget already and that this board does not have the ability to move budget items from line to line without doing the BAT, good old talk for Mr. Hayden. Uh, the budget appropriations transfer through the county process. Um, this project just, I mean, this contract, just like the prior contract, is one that the teachers want and use. It is one that's already budgeted. It's one that, uh, that I suggest that we need to approve. Ms. Eaton. Okay, I'm not saying that Dreambox or iReady are bad programs to use, but I would rather see us delay the vote than have a no vote. Mrs. Causey, then Mrs. Hen. Um, I'm making a motion that we delay the vote until the July 11 meeting. So there's already a motion on the table to approve this contract. Okay. Then I would just uh, ask my board members to not approve it, and then we can delay the vote and and evaluate it. I, I think one of the uh, and what's interesting is in the Building and Contracts Committee meeting, Dr. McComas said that there is additional information that she can give us about this program. And uh, to Mr. Gillis's point about the budget allocation transfers, we do them every year, and there are instances where the system spends money more in one place than the other, and the allocation happens. So it is a concern for each and every contract that comes up is it an appropriate allocation of the funds that we have for our students' best benefit? And uh, I was a little concerned about Dr. McComas' statement about, um, I, it was a wonderful analogy about the checkup, but what I'm hoping is that our teachers don't have a crunched limited time. Although we have heard that from our um, TABCO president, that's one of the things that we know helps the students is to have more time with the teachers, <clears throat> not to put something in between them. Um, so I would just ask my fellow board members to not approve the contract tonight and let's get additional information to make sure that it's fully vetted and vote on it in the Jul July 11th. Mrs. Meeting. Hen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I would second my colleague Ms. Causey's comments. It's time for this board to take a critical eye at each contract we move forward. And I applaud my colleagues and thank you for your support tonight um, with the vote on iReady. I think we need to um, consider the merits of all of these. Not, again, as Ms. Eaton said, not that these are bad programs, but we have serious needs. We have crumbling facilities. We've got transportation Absolutely. needs. Um, 
again, without going into the bat, these are all dollars that, that matter. So I would second Ms. Causey's comments and ask that we do not move this contract forward tonight. Johnson. So those are all capital needs. The, my, my concern or my question to the system, really, and this is more of just, I guess, a comment, is I am assuming that you guys don't pull this out of thin air and say, hey, you know what, we are going to use iReady and we don't have any, prog we're not going to balance, we're not going to take any progress reports, we're not going to get any um, information from other systems. Uh, we're going to move backwards and use systems that we used to use 10, 15 years ago, even five, six years ago. My assumption is that, you know, we're constantly saying the system doesn't do this, the system doesn't do this. The system does a lot for our students. And iReady, we heard repeatedly from teachers, we heard from administrative staff, I've heard personally because again I have children in the system and I sit with my, my children's teachers and they love iReady. And not just two children, I, I visit schools, I go to events, to, to, to multiple events. Not just the fun ones where we're shaking hands, the ones where we are actually having conversations with teachers and students and we have a real depth of, of knowledge from them. So things like Dreambox and iReady are not, again, not something that I'm assuming that the system pulls out of the air. So my question or my request to you, even though I won't be here, is that when we, we get these presentations, I know that you guys are so qualified. I know all the hard work that you do. So to sit here and delay this and ask for more reports and more reports and more reports, maybe just provide all of that stuff up front to the board um, because this board wants information, craves information. And uh, when it's presented, even if it's just then given to the to the curriculum committee, so then we have it on hand, or you guys have it on hand in the future for things like this, because these things really do need to move forward for the benefit of our teachers and our students and our system as a whole. <coughs> oh, I want to thank Ms. Johnson for her suggestion of more data up front. That would be very helpful. Um, but at this point. Uh, we are asking for more data, and I think the whole board has received enough concerning input from stakeholders regarding Dreambox that a look at it would be warranted. Um, so really that's all we're looking to do is get more information. So at this point, uh, I recommend um, voting against approval of the contract. Is there any new information that any board member wants to comment on? You've, uh, you've had a comment, but you have something else. I do. Thank you. Okay. Um, I would just like to say um, thank you for your comments, Ms. Johnson. However, we are not appointed to the Board of Education to assume anything. We're here to govern, and to govern is to understand completely what we are doing I never before said we assume. make the Stop putting you, words you said in it my twice, so uh, we can look at the video later, but that's fine. But in any case, and it's not the issue that we don't have qualified folks and that they don't care. We do have qualified folks, and they do care. But this system has moved forward so fast on so many initiatives all at the same time that there are unknowns that are happening in our school system. And, and we are going to be here as a board dealing with this in the coming year with, a, with, a, with new leadership. And it's going to require understanding. Perfect. And your new leadership is the chief, current chief academic officer. So you've got great leadership for that. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm good. Thanks. All right. All in favor of contract JNI 77814, which is contract number eight regarding Dreambox, please raise your hand. It too fails. Next is contract 14, which is JMI 63117, Information Technology Hardware. That, too, I believe, Mr. McDaniels, was a recommendation to not approve or to delay? Delay uh, for additional information. All right. Mr. Brown. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, hardware and technology. Chairman, um, I did gather some more information on uh, what you were asking for on the number of servers we currently have. We currently are sitting at just over a thousand servers in the district, and over 600 of them are virtual servers. 14. So we are continually looking at that uh, to move any other, and most of the virtual servers are running anywhere from three to four uh, services on those boxes. So did that answer all your concerns with that? It's a start, and okay. this was information that we had requested in committee for the rest of the board. I had asked for further in details on the plan to move from physical hardware purchases to virtualization of resources, which is a considerable cost savings to the system, and had requested of 
Mr. Brown for him to provide that report to the board because he had previously presented, which I appreciated, the fact that IT is moving towards virtualization of computing resources. Again, considerable cost savings for the district, certainly in our best interest. I know security has been a concern of my fellow board members. Um, I'm confident that that's the right direction, and you and I see eye to eye on that. So I had asked in committee for um, uh, the board to delay a vote on this until we receive more detailed information about the plan and timetable for moving from physical hardware purchases to virtualization as a cost savings. So again, with the other contracts looking for more information, I would ask us to delay. This any, make a motion. All right. so, so I, I move to delay the vote so on this item. To, there's a motion to, our to July delay. Is there a second on second, that? Second, second. All right. Is there discussion on that? Mr. Brown, how will how will a delay impact uh, the operation of your uh, the current meet part. contract that we're working on now expires July 31st. So if we can uh, have a, uh, if we don't get it passed in July of this coming up next board me meeting, then it would have an impact to us. And why don't you explain to the board whether converting to some cloud-based technology is something you can do with a snap of a finger or if it's something that's... It is, it's been in our plans for the last uh, four years <coughs> of continue moving the virtual servers. Uh, we continue to do that, look at new infrastructure. We compare, if the board recalls, we just uh, last uh, board, not last board meeting, but one of the previous board meetings, we approved the infrastructure for high schools to be redone. So that's where we're starting to concentrate on making sure those servers and virtual servers are installed there and reducing the number of physical servers. So it's still going to be a physical server due to the fact that we got to have one box to at least run multiple virtual servers in there. May so, I also ask if this contract is approved um, and you're in the process of converting to virtual servers, you would use these funds to do that as well? Yes, sir. All right. Any other comments or questions? So the vote is, uh, the motion is to delay JMI 631.17. All in favor of delay, please raise your hand. That motion fails. Um, so is there a motion to approve the contract? Motion to approve the contract. Is there a second? Second. second. All right, any further discussion on the motion to approve the contract? Uh, all in favor of the motion, Mrs. Causey. Excuse me. Uh, despite the vote that occurs, would you still be able to uh, give the information that my board member, Ms. Hen, that we discussed in Building yeah, and Contracts we, Committee? Yes, we've been working, like I say, we continue working on that. And if I can get from you exactly, Ms. Hen, the question in writing, I will provide that information. Thank so you. So I would like to amend the motion of approving this contract to include the report that Mr. Brown will provide to the board members. There's a motion to amend the uh, motion. Is there a second to the motion to amend? Second. All in favor of the motion to amend, please say aye. 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 All right, the motion carries now. The motion is to, um, uh, I think the motion carried. Maybe I should ask for a, a show of hands. A show of hands on the motion to, um, to amend. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Yeah, the motion carries. Uh, so now the motion is to approve the contract uh, with the proviso that Mr. Brown deliver additional information to uh, Mrs. Hen and to the board. All in favor of that, please say aye. Aye. All right, that motion carries. All right. Um, the last contract is contract 30, and we have not yet discussed this in contract committee, so I now deliver it to... Uh, Mr. Saris to or to Mr. Dixit to report on it. <clears throat> this request is not for a contract. This is submission of educational facilities master plan and comprehensive maintenance plan to to the state. Uh, these documents are prerequisite to our capital improvement program and have deadlines to it. Educational facilities master plan has to be approved by the board before July 1st, and comprehensive maintenance plan has a little more time after that. The development of uh, EFMP is with the Department of Strategic Planning, and the format of the EFMP is pretty much required and mandated by IAC. In their administrative guidelines, they are very clear about what needs to be included 
and the, uh, all of that information like enrollment projections, community analysis, condition of the building, inventory of the school building, they have all been prepared uh, between the Department of Facilities and Department of Strategic Planning. Mr. Dixit, if this report is not delivered to uh, the state or IAC by July 1, what's the impact? We will not be able to apply for a state chair of all the capital projects. All right. Are there further questions of Mr. Dixit? All right, um, Mrs. Causey. So this document of the Educational Facilities Master Plan that's due every year uh, is over 400 pages. Um, and the comprehensive maintenance plan, which is due every year, uh, was, a, I want to say, 89 pages. Okay. So the board received these through board docs um, as a link on Wednesday you got afternoon. a hard disk. Yeah, a disk. A disk. Yeah, a a CD disk. disk. So, you know, my HP device doesn't have a CD-ROM and neither does my Dell laptop. So in any case, I downloaded through the link. Can we amend a contract to get her a Dell <laughs> laptop with a CD reader? They're not in any of them. Your, your HP doesn't have it either. Uh, in any case, my, my point is is that I've, I've looked through it, um, but I cannot say that I've committed to memory or understand all of it. So I'd like to go through just a couple of things, uh, because what I'd like to get to is to understand how the um, EFMP and the CMP impact the capital Requests that will be coming to us later in August. Okay, uh, these are two separate documents. EFMP gives uh, IAC an idea of the enrollment projections, and funding of state share is a function of uh, enrollment projection. Approval of all of the capital projects have to do with the enrollment projections of that school and the schools in the vicinity, in the adjoining area. So when we submit our capital improvement program, they want to study that and they need all of that information. They also need community analysis prepared by strategic planning to get an idea of what the future of that community is. So that's in a very, very brief about the EFMP. For comprehensive maintenance plan, most of the information that is in there is already approved by the board. It has maintenance budget, it has, uh, the, the, the contracts that we have, all of the maintenance resources that a school system is utilizing to maintain the assets that have been partially funded by state funds. That's the intent of it. Is, and, uh, I'll is there a motion to approve the, uh, uh, the EFMP and the Math Comprehensive Maintenance Plan? So moved. Second. All right, there's a motion and a second. So is there further discussion? Yes. So. Uh, one of the items that's listed is transportation policies, 5-17. So I didn't print it out. I'm not going to take the time to pull it out. But is if you can tell me, uh, based on commentary we heard um, from our Northeast Area Advisory Council, is there a, uh, and, and it's probably not in the policy, it's probably in the superintendent's rule. So is there a rule or procedure that um, says that three to a seat for middle schoolers is appropriate? Is that level of detail in the EFMP? I don't think that's part of the maintenance plan. It says transportation policies, including policies for public schools, support such programs as safe routes to schools. That information was obtained by the Department of Transportation, and uh, I don't have that in front of me, but the, the policies or any information is consistent with the board approved policy. Okay, and then I had specific questions related to Delaney High School, um, because I see in here where it was rated with a adequate uh, facilities inspection, and that the state's inspection is dated back from 2011. So I'm curious as to why there isn't a state facility uh, score that's more recent, and I don't understand how we could give Delaney an adequate score based on all of the the uh, issues that we that we hear all the time. I've been through the school; it's in my district. I I I know them in detail. So help me understand how that's well, possible. De and Delaney was uh, rated adequate based on internal inspection at the time that inspection was completed, and um, state inspectors are independent inspectors 
what they, their rating is based on. That is the last inspection that was done by state. The state does not inspect every building every year. They set their own frequency, and we have nothing to do with that. All I can say is unbelievable. Uh, Mrs. Hen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I had concerns more of what was seemed to be omitted from the document than the content that I found there. Um, of particular concern was Towson High School. Um, the most recent rating um, by BCPS was a, a good rating on 116. I've toured Towson High School lately and was astonished that that was the case. Um, it's also cited as the most overcrowded high school in the system, um, which it is. However, the only plan put forth is for school impact studies to be coordinated for future developments. Um, there was no mention of any other solutions given that. And I share Ms. Causey's concern if this document drives the capital plan, then it's woefully um, missing of that detail. And those would be my concerns for not supporting this moving forward. The enrollment projections for Towson High are included in the document. So whatever enrollment projections are, they are the actual enrollment projections. What about a plan for the facility, both its condition and the overcrowding? The condition has been inspected by an inspector, and that is what they found. Uh, Towson High School has received hundreds of work orders, and all of those work orders, a lot of them have been completed. So the overall condition of the building is not determined by a problem or a minority of problems that have been found in the building. Let me you just know. remind the board that this is also a living document. It's not, this isn't a one-time submission. This has changed, maybe not daily or weekly, but it's changed periodically over the course of the year. Uh, so our, our system is going to be studying high schools this year, and that's going to impact this EFMP uh, as things go forward. So, and I, I just remind you, you said you would vote against it. If you vote against it, then we are out of state money opportunities. So I think that's a very important uh, thing for you to keep in mind. You can vote as you please. Mrs. Miller. Thank you. Um, again, we had six days to consume almost 500 pages of um, information, not including all of the other bombardments that we had on our agenda. Um, so I would recommend that going forward, maybe we could receive this document earlier. Um, I didn't get all that far into it, but I will. I did want to ask about the enrollment projections because I saw that what's being used is not BCPS's enrollment uh, projections, but um, I'm sorry, we're using BCPS's projections, not planning's, the Department of Planning's projections for us, which um, there was a, a slight discrepancy between the two, less than 5%, so planning said that that was acceptable to go ahead with our numbers. But Are you talking our about state planning or? Department of Planning and enrollment projections. Our Department of Planning? They do our enrollment. I'm just not sure who's. I'm not sure. It was oh. in a letter and it referenced the Department of Planning versus BCPS's enrollment projections. Um, now. Ours, let me finish my comment first. Ours are lower projections uh, than theirs. So uh, I wanted to know if that's going to be adjusted at any point going forward. Are we going to update those projections? And could that almost 5% variance, is that going, could that have a big impact? So, so to be clear, um, the projections are actually within less than 1% variance. The threshold is 5%. We are well within that. And the state actually um, validates that our projections are within that. Um, that's what that letter is about. Um, as some of you may be aware, we've engaged with um, the county and the Department of Planning with the county uh, to have a shared projection process where we incorporate information related to housing as part of that so that we understand how that could impact our projection process. That being said, we've validated that, we've shared that with the county over time, and um, again, we're well within the thresholds, well within, because it's a 5% threshold, and we're actually within 1%. Um, so I feel very comfortable with that, those numbers at this point in time. So will that be updated, though? It's updated every year. The, I mean, okay, so we're not gonna have an update before we submit again? 
I thought we were submitting again in July or? So the projections for this year have been completed. We will run projections again this fall after the September 30th enrollment is confirmed um, with all the other LEAs around the state. Thank you. Mrs. Head. Yes, at the Buildings and Contracts Committee where this was discussed, it was mentioned that we'd have an opportunity to submit an amended version, which could include more detailed plans for Delaney High School, for Towson High School. We have an ongoing conversation with the state and any additional information that we have, we'll sh we, can, uh, we can always share it with them. And could it be shared with this board as well? As I, I don't see any problem. I don't see any problem. Yes. Yeah. This is it. Mrs. Causey. So I, I would like to understand the process for what is uh, considered in the capital request. Um, because I would like to include planning money for Delaney High School because I think we need to do, as uh, was talked about, is a comprehensive approach uh, talking about not just Delaney, not just Towson, but in fact how if we look comprehensively at schools that need to be replaced, that there are economies of scale, there are savings, there are logistics uh, that are mutually beneficial. So what I don't want to do is leave from this meeting and not understand what are the timelines and what are the mechanisms to uh, discuss that as a system and have that included. Okay. All that I know at this time that we are planning to have a comprehensive study for high school which is going to be including condition of the building, enrollment projection, and all other factors, and then we'll share that study with board once, once the results come in. Other and questions? Oops. What is the time frame for that? It's, I don't have the time frame at this time. Well, then I think the board needs to discuss that at the board retreat, because it can't just go on endlessly. Yeah. And the, next year. The, the board, with its $250,000 addition to the budget, asked that we study that over the course of the next school year. So that would, in my opinion, assume any decisions for FY20 and beyond. The board also, at its August meeting, will see the first request that we will put in for our state capital submission. You won't vote at the August meeting, you'll vote at the September one, but first reader will be in August. So we will compile a budget request for you to consider. If the board wants to make any adjustments, they can do that before they vote in September. Thank you. All right, are we ready to vote on this? So the motion is to accept or adopt um, contract 30 ARA 22817 concerning educational facilities master plan and comprehensive maintenance plan. All in favor, please raise your hands. The motion carries. I'm abstaining. Next on our agenda is item T, curricula. Mr. Thank Johnson. You. Yep. Chairman Gillis and members of the board, the board's curriculum committee has met and we are forwarding the following items to the full board for approval. New, replace, new or replacement courses for career and technology education. There will be three Project Lead the Way engineer, engineering courses, uh, course designations, going from honors to GT or advanced academics. One of the, the first one is engineering aerospace. The second is engineering civil and architect, uh, I believe architecture, and um, engineering integrated manufacturing. The second agenda item that day or that we moved forward was six building and construction technology um, courses. These are replacement courses for the construction management program. So we're moving forward buildings and constructions one, the foundations, buildings and constructions two, carpentry and plumbing, buildings and constructions three, electrical and HVAC, building and constru constructions four, advanced construction, building and constructions five, crew leadership and application of construction methods, and building and construction capstone work experience. The third was we've got communication one, two, and three, which are new courses for middle school electives. And the courses to be recognized as dual enrollment courses for CCBC are as follows. Effective learning habits for college and career net readiness for grades seven and eight, dual enrollment courses with CCBC music appreciation and fundamentals of communication. We're doing course changes for these existing courses. ESAW will be uh, English as Foreign Language, EFL2. And then Fine Arts and Social Studies, we're uh, changing Arts and Advocacy, Japanese 1, 2, and 3, Civil Rights and Liberties, GT. And 12 VCPS courses are being presented for change in course title alone. These next generation science courses are as follows. 
Next Generation Science course, uh, grade seven, grade seven advanced academics, Earth Science, Earth Systems Honors, Earth Systems Advanced Academics, Biology, Living, Biology Slash Living Systems, Biology Slash Living Systems Honors, Biology Living Slash Living Systems Advanced Academics, Integrated Physics and Chemistry, Integrated Physics and Chemistry Honors, and Integrated Physics and Chemistry Advanced Academics. And lastly, changes um, in course title from Advanced Path to School Programs for, ex uh, for the Accelerated and re uh, Record of Credit, so, or the SPARC class. That was just a, the SPARC um, program. That was just a course title name change. And the Curriculum Committee meets this Thursday, the 15th at 4.30 p.m. So do I have a motion to approve the additions or changes to the curricula as detailed by Mrs. Johnson? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Discussion? Mrs. Causey. Um, for the courses to be recognized as dual enrollment courses with CCBC, um, are these taught at BCPS schools and with BCPS teachers? Um, yes, and also in combination with teachers from CCBC. So we have um, cases where students receive dual enrollment and it is taught by a C, uh, BCPS uh, employee and we have uh, many other instances in which students are actually taught by the college um, employees. Okay, but so it's done at BCPS facilities and is it done in the regular course of the day or do they work on semester systems the way the community colleges work or how, how does it fit into the students? It is integrated into our schedule and our system. Okay, great, thank you. And my next question is for the science courses. Is it just, it's just a name change so it doesn't change the content or the curriculum? Right, um, this was brought forward as a clarification of requests. Uh, there was concern that the the terms that NGSS uses specifically for biology are living systems. And there was a concern that um, we want transcripts to sh actually show the word biology on there. And just to cover all our bases, we wanted to go ahead and add the NGSS in front of all the designators so that people understood they were the courses aligned with the new standards. Okay, and then how do those courses move forward uh, for students that would want to advance to AP? because I've heard concerns that, that it may be harder to achieve advanced placement courses in some of the science areas. Every school has to, uh, as, actually NGSS opens up more pathways. Um, it's a, there's a chart that I could share with you that would illustrate it much better because it depends on um, where you enter your science and um, how quickly you can, for example, start as a ninth grader with uh, Earth Systems, then move into um, your 10th grade year in uh, biology, and then just as many students do, double up and take advanced courses uh, in their 10th, 11th, or 12th grade year, depending upon what um, track they choose to take. So for our high school um, requirement, the students have to take how many of these classes? Is it just? Uh, they will need to take uh, Earth Systems, Living Systems, and Integrated IPC, or they could take Advanced Placement um, Chemistry or Advanced Placement uh, Physics in lieu of IPC. In lieu of IPC. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's great. And then I had one other um, question. We received in our packet um, BCPS course concept review and approval phase one form which does have the course title the unit of credit the sponsoring office but it doesn't have the superintendent's cabinet meeting date filled in nor are there any signatures on it so I guess I'm wondering why is this in here what's the process for this form does do the right so <coughs> does that, the cabinet meeting is that a requirement that's supposed to happen and these are going to get filled in Yes, so those forms have already gone to cabinet. We need to go back and put the date on there, but they have already been vetted prior to going to the curriculum committee, prior to coming to here. Okay, so they will get signed and they'll be in a file somewhere. If you wouldn't mind, um, if you could please send to the full board that chart with the additional pathways, because I think that's going to be really helpful Absolutely. for everyone to know. I do also ask that when you look at that chart, please understand that we illustrate um, numerous case scenarios, but it is not um, the only case scenarios that could be illustrated. It could, it, it could take up multiple pages if we tried to map out every single scenario for students. So it's simply showing examples of certain paths that are now available. Right. And is that going to be available in the course selection um, or on the website somewhere where parents can be 
um, can can check on that? Yes, yeah, so that will be available. Um, we have shared it with guidance counselors um, since they typically are the ones who um, sit and work with students and families on selecting their, their sequence of courses. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. Mrs. Miller. Thank you. My understanding was that there was a tab code grievance filed over the changes to the science curriculum, and I'm wondering if perhaps Ms. Baton could come and confirm that and explain how it relates to this framework or doesn't relate to this framework. I, I think that's out of order. This is, this is a, um, um, not a public hearing on this matter. This is a matter for us to vote on to hear from Dr. McComas and to, and to discuss uh, the issue. So to invite third parties here is not appropriate. Well, I would just suggest that that third party is the president of the association that represents 9,000 teachers who many of them are the science teachers. Would a member of the central office come and either confirm that and maybe discuss how that relates to this? Ms. Miller, I would be more than happy to talk about the merits of uh, the curricular changes, but I don't believe that discussing the grievance itself or uh, if there was one would be appropriate at this time. Well, that leaves me with some concerns um, and leaves me wondering if maybe we should know more before we approve this. Okay, any other questions or comments? Mrs. Causey. So central office staff, the superintendent is not prepared to confirm or deny that there is a grievance filed by TABCO regarding these courses before we are being asked to vote on them? Um, I don't think it would be in the best interest of either side to discuss any grievance, whether it exists or not. Um, I don't think this is the appropriate form when we're asking for courses to be added so that we can print the course catalog for students. And general counsel can correct me if I'm wrong, I just don't think this is the appropriate venue to discuss that. I move to postpone the vote until we can get more information uh, right, so there's, perhaps a, there's already under, a motion on the floor. Well, but a postponement overrides that, correct? But no, no. Is that not correct? No, it's not, no, it's not correct. Council? If there's a motion to postpone. Then the motion to postpone overrides, does it not? If there, if there is a, it doesn't override it. If, if someone then makes a motion to, to postpone. Then there's a, that's their vote on that, but it doesn't override it. That's it's voted on. So, but I can make a motion to postpone on top of a motion. That's what I'm yeah. attempting to you do. Just, uh, you just did, yes. Oh, um, so okay. is there a second? I didn't finish my motion because I got interrupted. Well, but you've moved to postpone, and that's the motion. No, my motion is to postpone until the board yes, can but get the, that's more the, information. That's the discussion. So the motion is to postpone. And is there a second? No, that would be a motion to table. A motion to postpone would so come with a stipulation about how long. So I'm trying to make that, if you would allow me. I've never heard of I move to postpone until the board can get more information about the possibility that there was a tab code grievance that's related to this okay. uh, agenda item. Is there a second? Second. Is there any discussion? Is there a discussion on a motion to postpone? Um, Hold on. Yes. yes. Okay. Is it Ms. Brett? Oh, me? Okay. Um, I guess my question is just, if there is a grievance, hypothetically, wouldn't that be something we can take action on later? Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is essentially, so we can vote now and well, still make whatever changes necessary. The grievance, I think, is an administrative process that is beyond us. Right, but the board can, would not be making taking right. action on the grievance, but the board maybe could get some information about why so the, the teachers' right. union is objecting. If there was a grievance, the, there okay. would be action on the grievance. All in favor of the motion to postpone, please raise your hand. The motion fails. All right, the motion on the table is to approve the, uh, the curricula list provided by uh, Mrs. Johnson, all in favor, please raise your hand. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. The motion carries. All right, the next item on our agenda is a policy re review committee first reader. Mrs. Johnson. Okay. I. You. Yes. Right here. <laughs> Thank you. I know my things. Can I. Is this me? Here. Uh, you, 
can just re say the first, the, the list is right here. All right, the list for our policy review for first reader is um, policy 1240, policy 3200, policy 3209, policy 3310, policy 3330, policy 3620, and policy 3640. And I'm sorry, and policy 5470. And 5470, right. Yes. Thank you. Do I have a motion to adopt the recommendation of the board's policy review committee? So moved. Second. Then, all right, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Very good. Thank you, Mrs. Johnson. Next on our agenda is uh, action taken in closed session, and for that I invite Mr. Nussbaum. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, earlier this evening, the board considered two appeals regarding, one appeal regarding a confidential employee matter, and one involving a confidential student matter that was heard in your quasi-judicial capacity. These were both considered on the record as there was no request for oral argument made. At this time, it would be appropriate to confirm the actions that the board took in that closed session in those matters which are summary affirmance, or he, he, in the summary affirmances which are hearing examiner numbers 17-32 and 17-36. Is there a motion to uh, affirm the actions taken in closed session on 17-32 and 17-36? So moved. Second? Second. Second. All in favor, please say aye. 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 The motion carries. Thank, Thank you. you. There's motions on the uh, table for signature. Very Thank good. You. Next on our agenda is board um, committee updates. Um, so let's start with uh, Mrs. Miller and digital technology. Thank you. We have not met since we our last meeting, but um, I have asked for data on loss, breakage, and replacements of devices. And the um, Safety and Technology Committee meeting, um, we next meet on June 21st, so uh, next week, I believe. Uh, building and contracts. Just a reminder, quick reminder that we do have the two uh, contracts to review at the July meeting for Dreambox and iReady. So uh, we'll look for that information so we're prepared okay. then. Curriculum. Yes, um, we, we saw most of what happened in the, la the last curriculum committee, but this next curriculum committee meeting is this Thursday. While we've got your PRC. Yep, the next PRC meeting is scheduled for Monday, June 19th at 5.30. And the meeting is open to the public and our agenda will be posted on the school system's website prior to the meeting and we look forward to Mr. Birch's revisions and, at the second reader. An unsolicited testimony. <laughs> Mr. <laughs> Mr. Yulefelder, uh, audit. Audit committee is meeting next Tuesday the 20th. Very good, thank you for those updates. Uh, next on our agenda is uh, board member comments. I'll start with Mrs. Hen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. In the interest of time, I just want to wish all our students, everyone at Team BCPS, a great summer. I know we don't stop working, but the pace definitely slows down. So it's been a wonderful year, wonderful six months on the board so far. I want to thank everyone um, for working with me. I've certainly gotten an education in my six months and have enjoyed almost every minute. So thank you all. Happy summer. Mrs. Miller. Yes, thank you. Uh, I want to say farewell and best wishes to all of the uh, individuals who will be leaving us. Um, and next, I want to talk about the issue that is nearest and dearest to my heart, and I've been speaking out every meeting, which is the topic of school violence. Um, as we all know, there has been a disturbing number of videos posted on social media of uh, news articles related to school <coughs> violence issues in BCPS. Um, many parents have reached out to me over bullying and assault problems asking what to do. They don't really know what the process is. Um, you know, at, at what point do they, do they involve police? What are the steps to take? What are the proper channels? Um, so one important thing that I'd like to say to parents in this situation is don't delay. Don't allow anyone else to delay. Uh, it strikes me that parents really need information on these steps when they're dealing with uh, bullying and violence issues. And we really need an educational campaign for parents and staff on how to properly handle these issues of school violence. Mr. McDaniels. Thank you. Uh, I know we've recognized a lot of folks that are leaving us, um, but I did want to make a particular 
uh, reference to our student member who's leaving. I think um, the importance of the student voice and all we do in education is extremely important, and I think uh, Aislinn has done very well in uh, keeping us uh, connected with students in our system. And I also wanted to part, um, comment as a part of graduations, I was really impressed with the student speakers that spoke at uh, graduation. Many of them had some very forward-thinking thoughts, and um, I think some of our nation's leaders could take some uh, uh, advice from our students that spoke uh, recently because I was particularly moved by our students in our system and I wanted to congratulate them on their participation particularly and um, and Dr. Dance again this is our I guess our last meeting I, again I've uh, enjoyed working especially with you and I wish you all the best uh, from here on out and I just found that uh, Ms. Johnson was leaving uh, tonight and um, I think Baltimore County is very it benefits from having a very diverse population and I think Miss Johnson has a unique ability to connect with various parts of our community that no other board member I've worked with has so um, I compliment you on that and certainly wish you all the best in the future Mr. That's Birch, there's so many folks to say hello to and goodbye to. I felt like I've met thousands of people <laughs> between students and staff in the past, um, and families in the past 10 days. What a, what a huge, really, I guess two weeks, what a huge number of folks. Um, I have to get like my, my, sh my shirts lengthened from all the handshaking, just that. Uh, but certainly, uh, Aislinn, it's been, a, it's, been, it's, been, it's been wild. And um, really, good luck. I, the debate background that you take with you to Villanova, Best of luck. Um, Marisol, who I have had my disagreements with, but who I really like, and her, um, her spouse, Marwan, is just really just the tops. Um, this guy, Dallas Dance, I thought, he left, I thought he left a couple of months ago, but he keeps kind of like coming back. Uh, it's good to see you again, and uh, enjoy your, your remaining days. I know you're available to assist with our new interim superintendent. Um, and uh, um, best wishes to all the folks at the Hawthorne Elementary School who participated in their career day. It was a blast to be there and put the vestments on future attorneys uh, should they choose a legal career. That's it. Thank you. Ms. Brett. Um, I think I've said most of what I wanted to say in my earlier comments, but again, thank you to everyone who made this a really amazing year on the board. Um, I think you all are going to enjoy Josie, um, and I wish you all the best. I hope BCPS continues to be great. Thanks. Mrs. Johnson. Yes, thank you. So you have to bear with me. This is my last comments. <laughs> um, so you know, there's a few things that I live by or I have my family live by, and the first is to be on time. Um, and I've tried to do my very best to balance being on time and being a mom and owning a business and all these different committees. And I want to give a special thanks to my curriculum committee because I wasn't always on time for that one. So thank you, thank you for starting that one early without without me. Um, but you know, my timing to go is quite literally kind of perfect for me and my family right now. And. Um, I also tell my family to, or my kids, to, to say what they're going to finish, to, to do what they say they're going to do. And when I was sworn in on July 1st, 2012, I said those 77 words in my oath, and I meant every word of it, um, along with my now figuratively father, David Yulfelder. And our <laughs> <laughs> I'll adopt any time soon. Trust me. <laughs> and our then uh, board member, Jonathan Gala, and my dear friend, Romaine, and my family, I swore that I would do the best of my skill and my judgment, diligently and faithfully, without partiality or prejudice, execute the office of Board of Education member, according to to the Constitution and the laws of the state, and I have. Um, I also have learned along the way, and I've watched some pretty amazing people, specifically women, um, Ms. Decker, Ms. Prumo, Ms. White, Ms. Howie, Ms. Baton, um, Dr. Martin Knox, Ms. Blannard, Dr. McComas, Ms. Eaton, uh, Ms. Wistead. I've seen you guys lead through a lens of equity, equity, and I have tried to do that, to do what I would say was going to do for that as well. Um, I also tell my kids to always say please and thank you because those are some kind of lost arts and you have to say please and thank you to, 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 to people. So I'm going to get through this without crying. Um, I have to briefly thank, you, uh, thank my, my family. So first and foremost would be my kids for kind of giving, allowing me the sacrifice to be here. Me being at home in the evening is a, is a, is a unique treat, which I haven't been able to tuck my kids in as often as I would like to. Um, 
and my, my husband, who does pick up and drop off and cooks and kind of cleans a little bit. And, um, <laughs> and um, I can't thank him enough for everything that he has done. And really to Team BCPS. I, um, you know, if you want to know something about insurance and financial services, you can give me a call. I've got, I've got all those answers. But I've never pretended to be a budget analyst or an educator or a transportation expert um, or know how to write curriculum or an engineer or a school nurse or administrator or a lawyer um, those, or any of the other highly skilled and qualified positions that we have in the county. I know my role as a governing board member, um, but I want to thank the chiefs, the executive directors, the superintendent, the area soups, the executive directors, our union leader, our advisory council members, and all of the stakeholders out there, because you've provided um, me with information that I've requested individually um, in a timely manner. You have provided, did you cut my mic off? Okay. Um, <laughs> you, you have uh, kept me in the loop on a lot of things that, that have happened in, throughout the county. And I appreciate your skill set and your guidance, and in me most cases, your, your friendship. So I, I again, I, 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 I am so thankful for the opportunity, and I say thank you for that opportunity. The last is um, finish what you start. Um, which might seem kind of counterproductive to my resignation, but in attending the trainings, the graduations, the celebrations at schools, and collaborating, collaborating with most of my fellow board members, I have learned that um, if you don't grow, your, your knowledge base kind of stays stagnant. And I want to make sure that I don't get lost in the minutia of things and I, uh, things that I know that I can't control. I want to make sure that I move on beyond Baltimore County Public Schools and finish what I've started here as vice chairwoman on, on the school system. What most people don't know about me, actually, is um, I've always been a proud member of Baltimore County public schools and as a resident, but I wasn't born in this country. I was born in El Salvador in a small village that was ravaged by the Civil War. And my um, infant body was discovered and saved by a nun. Um, and that journey led me to, to the adoption of my two amazing parents. My mom and dad who taught me the value of equity and good and hard work, and my dad who actually sat in this seat 17 years ago and this seat 15 years ago. So a lot of people don't know that my dad was board president. And I didn't tell people that because I earned this seat. I made it here. And um, they showed me the value of education from being public educators for nearly 70 years combined. Mm. And they showed me that all means, when we say all, it really needs to be all. And um, we have, I have a direct impact. We all have a direct impact on our children in this county. And as the vice chair of the school system and moving forward, that is the reason that I won't stop fighting for all children. Um, if they happen to be of a different race or ethnicity or gender identification than myself or than my four black and Latino children that sat right there today, then, and I fight for them, then so be it. No Facebook comment, no comment here at the board meeting is going to stop me from fighting for our students and for our county. So I just want to say th I'm thankful for the opportunity and I look forward to the future. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Sol. Mr. Yulefelder. Tough act to follow. <laughs> um, what comes to mind after, after hearing uh, my young associates, and you know, it's interesting, um, you never stop learning. I, I say that at every graduation, irrespective of your age. And look how much I've learned from Aslan, Marisol, and Dallas. A, a tremendous amount of education uh, sitting around here. Um, and so I take it all in stride. It's, it's nice to learn. I look forward to continue to learn. Um, that's enough of that. Uh, what I wanted to say was one other thing, that some of us may have been uh, involved in some of these scholarship ceremonies at the various schools. So impressive. I, I just can't tell you how impressive it is and how I would really urge all my fellow members next year seek out the scholarship assemblies or scholarship awards. It, it's so heartwarming to see these kids earn so much. Um, and, and it just gives you faith in our, in our system. The other thing I wanted to say, um, in, in spite of what Ms. Miller said, uh, I don't see where uh, violence or incidents of violence in our school system 
uh, have reached any magnitude other than what people try and promote on social media. If our, if our pu public wants to know about bullying, get on the website. We have all the steps to take, all everything that the whole process of reporting bullying and so forth, it's there. And maybe we ought to instruct the public to use more of our website to get all this pertinent information and, and so they'll be more educated and more informed and make our life a little easier. Thanks. Mrs. Causey. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I just want to say that I was really honored and uh, I mean, it's just wonderful to uh, participate and celebrate. I was able to attend six of the 27 graduation ceremonies of BCPS. It's 10 days now, and then we have one day in the summer to uh, honor our graduates that make it through. Um, and I just wanted to say thank you to the teachers, support staff, the in-school administrators, the central office staff, and everyone who works day in and day out to make a positive impact on our students. Because there are wonderful things that are happening. As Mr. Ufelder said, if you attend the award ceremonies that are held in the schools, and they talk about all of the uh, scholarships that these students win, um, not just the large ones from, from SAT and so forth, but uh, the, the community ones, it's really, heartwarming and encouraging. Um, I just want to say that I hope everyone has a good summer. Um, and although many work, it is a different pace. Um, and I want to thank Governor Hogan, Hogan for extending it by two weeks this summer so we can all see you at the State Fair. Um, I also want to say good luck to all of our departing members. I was not aware that Ms. Johnson was going to be leaving the board. Ms. Bratt, we know we lose our student member every year, and she's been phenomenal. Uh, and I wish her well in the Nova Nation. And, um, and Dr. Dance uh, has been so pivotal in our county. Everyone has contributed to BCPS with their hearts and their minds and their hard work. I also want to welcome Mr. Roger Hayden. As a new board member, I look forward to your contributions from your experience as a board member, board chair, and county executive, uh, but also from your work experience in organizational management. So I think that's going to um, be helpful to us as we look to improve the board. Um, and I want to say also, despite transitions, I'm very encouraged about our new leadership in Verlita White, and I look forward to her engaging with the board and us working on uh, the, the large issues that are in front of us and continuing to make progress for our students. So I wish everybody a good summer. Thanks. Mrs. Eaton. Thank you. Aislinn, good luck in college. I know you'll do great. Um, Marisol did a fine job as our um, co-captain. <laughs> Dr. Dance, I know you will be successful in whatever the future holds. Welcome, Mr. Hayden. Welcome, Ms. White. And I'd like to thank um, Michelle for being a great friend. Thank you. Now, for the first time, we get to ask Mr. Hayden if he has any parting comments tonight. Morning. Is it over? <laughs> Am I finished? <laughs> that quick? I, uh, there are things that you do where it's sort of been there, done that, and uh, certainly today was a been there, done that uh, experience for me, including a couple people sitting in the audience who used to sit out there when I was on the board way back when. And they're still here. Maybe you didn't let them out. I, I should have checked. But the whole idea and my desire to be involved really revolves around kids and education. Kids are the bottom line. That used to be my catchphrase when I was on the board years ago, and it still is. Kids are the bottom line. And if we all work along that line to say, what can we do to make it better for the kids? It will get better for the kids. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to uh, steal one second uh, because we really didn't get a chance to thank Dr. Dance as part of our public um, portion of the agenda. Um, we had a nice resolution for you. We have a, we have a beautiful portrait of you. Uh, but I'd just like to lead a round of applause to say thank you. Uh, 
so there's a few information items in uh, your materials. Our next school board meeting is uh, July 11th, and of course the school systems offices are closed so that we can celebrate our nation's holiday on July 4th. We're adjourned.